Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. A um, couple reminders before we get started. Everyone, please um, silence your electronic devices um, before we get started. I also wanted to remind folks who are going to be uh, testifying today that we have um, a mixed audience. A lot, oftentimes we have um, youth in the room, and we just want to be using... Um, language appropriate for public spaces and just keeping in mind that there are folks, that there is a wide variety of folks um, who are either attending here in person or listening um, online, so just please keep that in mind. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your cameras. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Commissioner Myron. Oh. Aye. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I thought I did it too early. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Bram Edwards. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Vega Peterson. Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it, is your, when it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for two minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. We received 12 verbal testimonies and three written testimonies. Um, we're going to start, I think, with online testimony. Andrea Chiaverini, I'm going to um, unmute you. I sent a request to unmute you. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Andrea? Hello? Hi. Go ahead and begin. I apologize. I did not realize I was going to be at the very beginning and I'm walking away from a work meeting. Um, I, I can't tell if I'm being heard or not. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, my name is Andrea Shiverini. I've been living in Portland for over 25 years, and I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I'm board certified in addiction medicine. Um, I work with people who, um, in, a in a detox facility as well as on the streets. I'm here to say that I love people who use drugs and I value their lives. I'm fully in support of the county expanding and increasing harm reduction services, including the fact that people who access these services, I'm sorry, let me start over. I'm fully in support of the county expanding and increasing harm reduction services. We have decades of scientific research showing multiple benefits of these services, including the fact that people who access these services are much more likely to engage in other services such as overdose prevention supplies and substance use treatment. More importantly, we have the voices of those with lived experience who have historically been the foundation of harm reduction provision. Many of them are still alive today as a direct result of having access to safer ways to use drugs. The drug landscape in this country has drastically changed over the past decade and is currently a public health emergency and more people are dying. Changing our approach to meet changing needs is not a matter of opinion. It is supported by years of scientific research. If we value their lives, and I definitely do, we have to approach this crisis with empathy, love, and evidence-based public health policy. Thank you. Um, next, we have J Judah McAuley. Judah, if you unmute yourself, you can begin. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. And thank you all for uh, being here today uh, to listen to me. I, too, would like to uh, speak in favor of the harm reduction supply issue that has come before the county commissioners. And first, I want to say, having worked with um, some of you before in other contexts like Portland Public Schools, I firmly believe that the Multnomah County commissioners are on the side of making things better for all people in the county, but especially those most at risk of harm uh, out on our streets and in our communities across the county. And as such, I want to talk today about the importance of harm reduction work in our communities. I know that historically we've seen pushback against all the manners of harm reduction work. Uh, decades ago, it started with the syringe exchange. Those have become you know, more and more accepted. But each time we have a new avenue for it to bring dignity, health, and safety safety to our most vulnerable in our communities, we see the same kind of pushback that we're seeing today. And the results are always the same. It's based in fear, it's based in ignorance of what the research says, and it's based in this idea that if we help those who are most vulnerable, that somehow we're giving something up as a community. And I'd like to, us to all stand today to reject that notion to recognize that we have a history of going out and working to protect the vulnerable in our communities and meeting them where they're at, to help them see their own dignity and to show up as human beings. And every time we do that as a community, whether it's through syringe exchanges or now through safer smoking supplies and tinfoil distribution and all the other things that people are now saying, wait, we do that? That by meeting people where they're at, by extending a hand and Time. providing ourselves as trusted partners, we go ahead and we meet and we help people show up and meet us and we make their lives better. And that is our job as leaders and commissioners. And so I'd encourage you to revisit the issue, let your experts be your experts and let them do Time their job and support and shield them. So please show up for our community and thank you very much. I think that's everybody who um, joined us virtually. So I'll move to um, in-person testimony. Richard Perkins, Steve Herring, Marsha Gullick, and Rolf Brochler. Good morning. You can go ahead and begin. My name is Dick Perkins. I'm in support of Sharon Myron's request to allocate 25 million of the funds being discussed today in the briefing to the acquisition of Crown Plaza. I also support her plan for standing up a real plan for behavioral health in Multnomah County as outlined in her letter to Chair Peterson and Mayor Wheeler. Let me give you a few examples why. Krista Jones was kind enough to give the Behavioral Health Resource Center GNA work group a copy of the Portland area Houseless Committee, Community Outreach Resources document. Yesterday, I tested it out calling PATH, which is the source listed for SUD services. I got an answering machine which gave me guidance to call the County Behavioral Health Call Center, which I did. After only a brief wait, I got a very nice person who identified herself as a clinical social worker. I identified myself and asked her what my options were if I were to walk, uh, talk to somebody on the street who was interested in getting into treatment. After a long script telling me about insurance contingencies and a number of other depends upon, she admitted that there was only one immediate option, Hooper Detox, run by Central City Concern, but you have to be there at 7.30 in the morning and access is limited. Last night I was on a discussion panel at the Living Room Theater that aired the documentary The Definition of Insanity about a diversion program in Miami. 
the chair saw this in April with Earl Blum Blumenauer and mayor, the mayor and the governor. Nobody in the audience of 65 recalls seeing any outreach workers downtown talking to those on the street <coughs> who I converse with daily. Thank you so much. I have, uh, will you let the other person go? I'd like to speak. Um, uh, no, no, I have sorry. witnessed. Everybody has the same amount of time, so your time is up. But thank you so much. If you have written to us, <coughs> we'd be glad to. Um, you can give it to the board clerk, and, and um, she'll make sure that we get it. Uh, to the you, board. you have a copy. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Steve Herring, and I'm the CEO of Living Room Theaters, the theater that hosted those screenings last night. Completed the third night of screenings where we invited the public to come and attend, and we uh, hosted discussions with various officials, including Judge Leifman from Miami on Sunday, uh, local Multnomah County Circuit Court Judge Nan Waller on Monday, and Dick Perkins and several others last night. My last appearance before this commission was back in February, where after I testified publicly and provided a no comment to a local publication, they used my words here as the opening line in their article. So I'd like to begin by just talking about a woman who was at our screening last night. We opened up to the people that were in the audience to questions, and uh, at one point this woman introduced herself and she was saying she came from a different uh, point of view to the discussion that was at hand. And she described how her young son had been denied services as someone diagnosed with schizophrenia. Then she went on to tell us that he is now in jail after murdering someone. So <clears throat> without a destination for treatment, the thing that I've taken away from since February to now and all these screenings, talking to the experts, without having a place where our first responders, our hospitals, and everyone else can send someone for treatment, every other dollar, program, promise, or hope that you put forth is wasted. We're wasting the dollars and resources that we have today on intermediary steps that do no, no noticeable difference in actually having effect in what's happening on the streets. So I support Commissioner Myron's proposal for the purchase of the Crown Plaza Hotel. I see it as our best and only hope in the near term to provide a location to bring people who are in mental health crisis or going through an episode because of addiction. <clears throat> this commission, I have learned over the last five months, effectively controls the purse strings for all the dollars that go through the city and county for homeless services in our area. Our city right now is basically a patient that is flatlined, and you all hold the paddles. And it's your decision whether or not you're going to stand around and form another committee, or you're going to say, clear, and shock us back to life. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Marcia Gulick, and I live in the South Parks Blocks. I don't go out my front door without seeing someone who needs help. Um, someone could be raging at the sun, but more recently now, I see someone bent over sitting on the park bench, uh, unresponsive. Um, the other thing I see is people with tin foil and uh, with their straws and their lighters. Um, last weekend, I got training in how to use Narcan, and I have a supply with me that I can use if I see someone unresponsive. So we need a place for our citizens, for detox, for treatment, and for services so that they can have healthy <coughs> lives. I encourage you to create a plan to address the situation on our streets. And I also see the purchase of the Crown Plaza as an important piece to relieving the struggling and suffering we see on our streets, which is so inhumane. <clears throat> My granddaughter's favorite activity used to be to come downtown and ride the streetcar with me. She loved it. We went all over on the streetcar. Last summer, there was an incident uh, with a person with very bizarre behavior on the streetcar, and she doesn't want to ride the streetcar anymore. Please use county funds to purchase the Crown Plaza and create a plan for care and recovery so that we can bring health to our citizens and lead them to a better life. This is an important piece. The Crown Plaza is an important piece of the larger puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Rolf Brockler, member of the Behavioral Health Task Force, and I'm speaking today in strong support of ideas and action plans proposed by Commissioner Myron. 
Uh, her proposals are concrete ways to make use of the available 2023 supportive housing service funds and the un unanticipated surplus dollars. First, we believe the county should finish the Analyze, Align, and Act project, which is a collaborative project to create a plan for functional behavioral health system in Multnomah County. This project was stalled at the onset of COVID and in the context of significant turnover in the county health department. Completion now will have a minimal cost and can be accomplished within a year. In support of this project, a comprehensive gaps analysis should be undertaken. For example, OHSU, Central City Concern, and other community partners have mapped the need for elements of the substance use disorder continuum of care. Also, Multnomah County's Office of Consumer Engagement is in touch with people with lived experience involving substance use disorder and or mental illness. These people can provide insights into the existing system and what is missing from the consumer perspective. Then in support of the, uh, this holistic blueprint for better uh, behavioral health outcomes, the county should acquire Crown Plaza Hotel. This project would help answer the question, discharge to where? It would provide recovery-based supportive bridge housing, one of the most critical missing links in our behavioral health system. It would help to increase treatment and step with greater capacity for recovery-based housing. It can be a place to go after treatment so that people are not continually discharged to homelessness and thereby repeat the same unproductive and self-destructive cycle. As identified today, funds are available to acquire this property. Finally, we should declare the fentanyl crisis a public health emergency and activate the right people to address it as such. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Taylor Middlestep, Carly Laney, Charles Bridgecrane, Antoinette Demote. You can begin. Hello, my name is Taylor Middlestead. Um, I'm a psychology and health studies student, and I work with the Portland People's Outreach Project, which is a harm reduction group. Um, and I wanted to speak today in favor of harm reduction, um, especially with regards to the pipes. Um, in my experience, I found that it's important to give them out for a few reasons, the first being that um, People who use drugs when given the option will often choose uh, alternate modes over injection when they are given the resources to do so, which can allow for safer practices and less risk of bloodborne infection or overdose. And my second being that for those who only smoke, offering these safe supplies allows us to also offer our community space and to further connect them with. Um, both material resources like our wound care supplies or Narcan and with other people or groups that can help foster a uh, higher quality of life or offer a broader range of resources. I believe it's important to fight the, uh, the knee-jerk reaction we have to harm reduction causes when the idea that they uh, incentivize or increase drug use has been proven uh, objectively untrue and ultimately offering pipes in addition to other harm reduction services can help save lives, which is the important thing to focus on. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Hello. My name is Carly Ann Laney. I come here today as a native Oregonian and Portlandian. I am here not as a city employee with Portland Street Response, nor as an on-call employee with the health department. I am here as a community member with a wealth of lived experience and a bachelor's and master's degree in social work. I am here to respectfully request your position on the addition of harm reduction supplies, foil and straws, at our county's harm reduction clinic. All the evidence that's available, all the research that has been done on harm reduction services is clear and unequivocal that people accessing these services aren't more likely to use drugs or to use them longer, and the services do not lead to an increase in people who initiate drug use. If anything is enabled or promoted, it is education, safer practices, and a proven reduction in communicable disease transmission. I was 17 years old the summer of my senior year when I injected heroin for the first time. I remember that first day. We bought a point, a syringe, from a store on West Burnside and 6th Avenue, a dollar for a syringe. 
I did not know at the time, but this was the beginning of my drug using history. My first visit to a needle exchange was the old outside in house on the corner of Southwest 13th and Salmon. This is where I learned and was educated on hepatitis C, hepatitis C treatment, recent overdose trends, and drug trends, what was in the community, hepatitis C vaccines, how not to use alone, how to treat a wound, and most importantly, where to access treatment. Through the exchange at Outside Inn, I built rapport with the staff who directed me to the homeless youth services. When I was ready to quit and get off the street, I knew where to go to get help. My catalyst for change, the murder of my friend Alexandria Nicole Eisen, also known as Tomorrow, a 17-year-old houseless girl dependent on heroin and doing survival sex work, was the last victim of Todd Allen Reed, the Forest Park killer in 99. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, my name is Annie Damata, and I'm here to show my support for the distribution of safe smoking supplies in our community. I'm a social worker, and I co-founded and run a harm reduction organization called the Everly Project. Our services include the distribution of safe use supplies, including safe smoking supplies like pipes and foil. We distribute over 200 pipes per week. We also provide food, medical care, clothing, counseling services to people who are unhoused and actively using drugs. I'm here to encourage you to move forward with the plan for Multnomah County to distribute these same materials. These supplies save lives and improve quality of life while building trust through compassionate and empathetic service delivery. If you've never used drugs or worked closely with others who do, you might be surprised and confused about the distribution of safe smoking supplies. There are a lot of strong feelings and misinformation out there that could lead you to believe that this is harmful or that it enables people to continue your use. I can assure you that that is rhetoric and nothing could be further from the truth. As a social worker, much of the care I provide is trauma work. I'd like to share with you a little bit of what I've learned over the past several years providing care to people who use drugs. Chaotic substance use, substance use that's harmful to a person's health and well-being is almost always rooted in complex trauma. I've worked with people whose earliest memories are of violence and fear. I've spoken with people who've been stabbed, shot, beaten within an inch of their lives. I've worked with people who have never known a safe relationship and people who have been repeatedly targeted by violence because of their race, gender, or sexual preference. Our community is full of people living in pain and unable to find the resources they need to go to heal because we fail to provide them with basic needs like housing, food, and clothing. Trying to access counseling to begin healing is impossible, especially if you're not in recovery. Drug use is one way that people can ease the pain of trauma and its effects on our bodies and minds. Drug use can be a means of survival, a way to stay awake when you're, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning again. I'm Charles Simca Bridge Crane Johnson. And please, for the love of God, can we throw the phrase harm reduction in the toilet? Um, it's two weeks now. We've been agonizing about eighty frickin' thousand dollars worth of tinfoil. I want addicts to get recovery, safety, and respect. In all this agonization, nobody has put forth a peer-reviewed study that relates to distribution of pipes and foil. However, I'm okay with us doing it because while we agonize over the stupid phrase harm reduction, we hear people repeatedly say. We're trying to bribe addicts to come to our services and move up. That's all tinfoil and pipes are. When we did harm reduction for needles, we had clear medical arguments about the transmission of bloodborne pathogens. We could make up medical evidence about how if each person restricts themselves to their own personal pipe stem that they get for free, then they won't transfer the flu or COVID to their partner that they're using with to use safely. Um, but this phrasing that harm reduction for needles is the same as harm reduction for foil and straws is an agonizingly painful process for our community. Just say, uh, you know, there's, I, I don't know if we're talking about eventually increasing the $80,000 amount. I'm not concerned that uh, we block outreach workers from f having foil and pipes so that they can also distribute Narcan and test strips. However, they should always, every time they hand out a pipe or a piece of foil, also be verbally engaging about Narcan, test strips, 
and if we're ever maybe going to buy the Crown Plaza and have expanded recovery spaces. So um, $80,000 while 6,000 people are homeless and we don't know the ratio of addicts in that community, God help us. Thank you. <clears throat> Brandy Fishback, Dan Hagen, and Lightning. Good morning, you can begin. Okay, my name's Brandy Fishback, and I'm the co-founder of the Everly Project, which is a harm reduction um, nonprofit. I came here and testified when I was in recovery for about a year with my peer support specialist, and I came to recovery through harm reduction. Um, I just want to be in very much support of handing out smoking supplies as well. We do this and we see the community that's built. We see the beautiful progression in people and it's just a way to connect and show love and it does so much. I've been through six different treatments and I tried NAAA everything, but finding a peer support specialist that taught me love through harm reduction, I was able to learn to love myself. And now I get to run a program that does that every day for people. And I am in full support of handing out supplies. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. commissioners. Um, I'm here to speak about um, not just my personal issue, but I'm sure it's throughout the city is um, county funding for rent assistance ended on June 1st. All programs ended on June 1st. I just called 211 just now. Not a single program has any funding. There's no money to any of these rent assistance programs. And yet I see on this agenda item, unanticipated surplus dollars for supportive housing services. Does anyone, what's, what's this all about? I got a 30 day eviction notice just yesterday. So. It's been how many weeks? I'm not sure how many weeks it's been. And I'm not here to chastise you, because uh, I need some, we all need your help. But I don't know if anyone's aware that there's no money. And people need the money. And it's pretty upsetting to see a surplus. <laughs> so anyway, that's what my comments were. I also wanted to thank Stacy Burke and Ruby for being so nice last week. Those are my comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is, is that, oh. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Emergent. My subject is, again, I've been the most outspoken person against having Multnomah County River Patrol patrol our waterways. Again, I feel that they're nothing but a experiment that has gone terribly wrong. Again, I'm in full support of having the United States Coast Guard patrol our waterways. They're the best trained. They have a history and a heritage that I have great respect for. They've dealt with my relatives in the past on numerous projects. And again, I do not want Multnomah County River Patrol patrolling our waterways. I say that from personal experience. I'm previous owner of Columbia River Marina at 3333 Northeast Marine Drive. They came on my property. They basically set something on my dumpster. I confronted them when I saw them, caught them in the act. I asked for a business card from one of the people that were doing it. By the time I went down to the Sextant Tavern, River Patrol pulled their weapons on me. I went back to my dumpster to see what they put there. They put a little case with four little beakers in it. Four little beakers. They've tried to set me up numerous times on my property. When they failed each time, they sent their thugs 3.30 in the morning, 
tapping on my windows, trying to create a confrontation. We know how that ends with law enforcement when they do that. They are corrupt, they are criminals, they are thugs, and I'm demanding that they surrender their badges. And I will recall you if we don't come to a settlement on this. I will still do my development, I will still operate my business, and I will never stop. They are criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Criminals do not need to wear badges. Shut their funding down and remove them off the rivers. Thank you. That's all the public testimony we have for today. I'm gonna move to R1. Thank you. Uh, R1, briefing on F1. Lightning, thank you. You had your three minutes. If you wanna talk about this further, I can have you talk to one of my staff happily. That'll do. be fine. Okay, thank, thank you, you for your time. R1, briefing on FY 2023 supportive housing services funds and unanticipated surplus FY 2023 SHS dollars. So good morning, everyone. We're gonna have the uh, briefing for this. We'll have the folks come down in just a second. Um, this is our chance to um, have a full board briefing um, and a public um, briefing about the um, about our supportive housing services underspending, also the unanticipated revenue um, that Metro has alerted us about um, in the last month. Um, this has been. Uh, I would just want to first thank um, Serena Cruz, Stacy Bork, Dan Field, in my office for all of the work that has been happening over the last several weeks as we've been um, engaging with Metro on this. Um, we have a, a solid plan that's been negotiated for the underspending. Now we're at the time of the process where it needs to come before the board for your input and conversation. Um, I also want to um, thank the entire staff of the joint office, all of the folks at Metro um, and in the larger county family for the work on this as well. Um, we've really um, been able to um, have conversations about what this could look like as well as the next steps around executing this plan. Um, and this is the time really for your good thinking, your engagement, your ideas to, to come into this process as we're talking about this. Um, the timelines that we're gonna be talking about today um, is going to be around this action plan and we will have further um, discussion and we'll have a further opportunity to actually take action on this later this summer, um, late August, early September. Um, but with that, you know, I'm really glad that we're at this point in the process then. Uh, it took a lot of work to get there. And with that, I want to bring up our, um, our boards, our presenters to the uh, dais. Thank you. Chair, commissioners, thank you so much for having us today. My name is Stacy Bork. I use she and her pronouns. I'm policy advisor in the chair's office. Uh, I want to flag a couple of things, just one specific thing. We sent an updated presentation right before this, um, and there was a missed date. Uh, it said 22, and it should have been 21, and that was on slide 16. So Commissioner Brim Edwards asked, and I just want to flag that specifically here. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So first I want to thank uh, the commissioners and your teams for your ongoing engagement uh, as we work through the process and the individual and thoughtful discussions that we've had uh, in working down towards this corrective action plan and, and having some initial conversations on the unanticipated revenue that we are receiving from Metro this year. I also want to appreciate the chair's directive for the increased transparency and inclusion towards the underspend and most importantly the unanticipated revenue and how we invest these resources moving forward. The Joe's leadership leaned in and welcomed the opportunity to broaden this and we're thankful to be here to be able to brief you today. Uh, as the chair mentioned, there's no board action today. It's an opportunity to 
walk through the corrective action process, talk about the unanticipated revenue, and um, what, what that engagement will look like further. I also want to note that the corrective action plan is part of a much larger body of work that the joint office has undertaken with the chair's directive, uh, and much of that is outlined in the letter from the chair that you all received yesterday. So it's it's an important part of the piece of the pie, but it is just a piece of the pie of the work that we're doing. We're going to provide uh, some updates or an overview of supportive housing services, the funding, uh, the regional goals, some of the budget history. And for many of you, that's you've been through this a number of times. SHS rolls off the tongue. Um, but Commissioner Brim Edwards is new uh, to the board, and we are doing our best to get her up to speed on a very large body of work for the county. And so we're going to provide just a little bit more background. We will also walk through the CAP process, corrective action plan that we developed with Metro. We'll talk about um, the one-time only underspend for fiscal year 23, as well as the one-time only revenue look ahead that, we, uh, that we're on un the unanticipated revenue moving forward. And finally, we know that you will have questions and uh, we welcome those and expect them. We also know that we might not have all the answers today, which I think brings us the, you know, the opportunity for a briefing. So Sarah Guest, who's the chair's communications advisor, is in the back and she is capturing all of them so we can ensure that we can follow up in a timely way and get back to you on your questions. So thank you for having us. And next slide, please. And with that, I think it's gonna be me, yeah. So good morning, county uh, chairs and commissioner. My name is Kanoi Eggleston. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm the director of programs at the joint office. I'm gonna give you this slide. We'll overview uh, just a quick snapshot of the supportive housing services measures, the regional and local goals, um, just to be able to give us a foundation as we move forward in the uh, briefing this morning. So in, as you all know, in May of 2020, the voters passed a pretty historic measure to address homelessness in our metro region. Um, the SHS measure, you know, really allows the county to continue to fund proven solutions that work, as well as fund new and innovative programs to address homelessness. Key elements of this measure, you know, really focus on the regionalization across our jurisdictions and also being able to coordinate and collaborate with our community-based organizations. I want to note this just because I think this is a really, these partnerships are truly, honestly, what makes um, this measure transformational. There is a goal uh, to focus 75% of the funds on population A households, as well as 25% of the funds for population B households. I wanna give a quick update on that. We often get questions around um, this goal. And so, uh, you know, quarterly with Metro, we do report population A and population B in relation to our housing placement and prevention goals. So in our first year of implementation in fiscal year 22, 85% of the households were considered population A and 15% of the households were considered population B. We are reaching that goal in fiscal year 23 as well and as of quarter three in our report to Metro, 73% of those households are in population A and 27 are in population B. Next, I'll move on to the middle section of our slide here. It's around the regional goals that we have across the tri-county region for the SHS measure. The regional goals really focus on reducing chronic and episodic homelessness, reducing racial disparities across communities of color within the tri-county region. Also being able to connect 5,000 um, chronically homeless households with supportive housing and stabilize 10,000 homeless households into permanent housing across our tri-county region. And of course, we have local goals um, within Multnomah County in relation to the SHS measure. Multnomah County, we created a local implementation plan, so you'll hear us talking a lot about the LIP. This plan really lays out a framework and a foundation for how the funds will be used in our county. The Joint Office also creates an annual work plan each year that sets annual goals that work towards our overall LIP goals. 
So the LIP goals, these are our long-term, these high-level goals are really to be able to add um, 2,235 permanent supportive housing opportunities to the county's overall portfolio. Also be able to develop a homeless system that will annually place 2,500 people into permanent housing and rapid rehousing programs, as well as annually deliver eviction prevention services to 1,000 people. So in alignment with all of these uh, overarching goals, the immediate goals we have set in our um, annual work plan for FY24 are really aligned to build the infrastructure and capacity required to achieve the overarching 10-year LIP goals. And so some quick updates about those LIP goals. Um, currently in fiscal year 24, we are set to achieve 1,500 of the 10-year PSH capacity goals, so about 67% of those PSH units. And then as of our quarter three report, uh, we are higher in most of our goal categories around placement and prevention, making that like steady progress as we lay that foundation to be able to um, meet those t that 10-year LIP goal. And then our quarter four report will be completed at the mid mid August and we'll bring that information back to the board um, to be able to update you on our overall fiscal year 23 uh, placement and prevention and PSH goals. So that's a quick foundation setting and I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, I think Antoinette, for the next slide. Thank you. Good morning. Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, my name is Antoinette Payne. I use she and her pronouns. I am the finance manager senior for the Joint Office of Homeless Services. I want to express my deep appreciation for the opportunity to present today. I have been part of Monomah County for nearly 10 years, working in finance, primarily in leadership roles. It was just two months ago that I joined the joint office. This is my first time presenting to the board in this position. I look forward to today's presentation and to building my relationship with this board in this role. In addition to my experience with the operations of the county, I have also worked as a county provider offering culturally specific services. I'm here today to provide an overview of the Joint Office Supportive Housing Funding. You're going to, to recognize this slide from the board presentation more than a month ago. This slide provides a comprehensive overview of the adopted budget for the Joint Office with the focus of supportive housing services covering a span for six years. Initially, in 2019, the first column, the joint office received balanced funding from both the city and the county. The county is represented in dark blue and the city is in orange. Following the approval of SHS by voters in May 2020, the joint office allocated $53.1 million for SHS funding in FY22, the light blue in the fourth column. The SHS budget experienced a significant growth in FY23, column five, nearly doubling. You recall that the board adopted a 30% increase in the FY24 adopted budget for SHS. It is worth noting that the department's total adopted budget was increased substantially from 71 million to almost 295 million over six years, largely driven by the growth in voter approved SHS funding. Next slide, please. You'll recognize this graph from the budget presentation. This slide offers a comprehension of the adopted budget for SHS in the joint office for FY23 and FY24, covering two fiscal years. In FY23, the board approved 90.8 million for ongoing funding and 16.3 million for one-time only funding. In FY24, the joint office budget saw an increase with 96.2 million allocated for ongoing funding and 40.5 million for one-time only funding. Next slide, please. Once again, you recognize, you may recognize this slide from the budget presentation about more than a month ago. The slide pre uh, this slide presents a comprehension of adopted budgets by division in the joint office for FY23 and FY24 spanning two fiscal years. It is important to note that funding allocation for safety off the street, the third grouping, is decreasing, while supportive housing, the fifth grouping, is increasing. 
The shift is a result of realigning city funding, specifically moving from supportive housing, housing to shelters in order to better align with the city priorities. Regarding system access and coordination, second grouping, there is a significant increase in funding. This increase fully funds regional coordination, set aside 10% for reserves, and allocation for 5% for contingencies. This total budget for this division is 14 million under program offer 30006A. For housing placement and retention, grouping four, there's a notable addition to the budget. This includes a new allocation of $10 million under program offer 30310 for housing minimum now, as well as 16.5 million under program offer 3030B for COVID-19 emergency response placements of individuals transitioning out of shelters. In FY23, these costs were previously covered by ARP funding. Supporting housing grouping five experienced an increase due to additional site-based commitments under program offer 30400A through F, along with the increased support for families youth through program offer 30403 and 30404. Next slide, please. I realize that I don't have to have the entire microphone in my mouth to be heard, so I'm sorry for really coming so loud, loud there. Um, uh, so the corrective action plan, um, or a CAP, which is what I'm going to refer to it as, and, um, was initiated by Metro, next slide please, um, officially in June. And I want to provide a little bit of context about why we received a corrective action plan, um, which ultimately is that we were ambitious in what could be delivered and spent in the first year emerging out of COVID um, and transitioning leadership within the joint office. Provider vacancies, recruitment, retention, and capacity continues to impact uh, the ability to expand and grow work among our community providers. So in the corrective action plan, it consists of priority uh, programs, a spending plan, and monthly reporting. So part of that, uh, wh what we are, have negotiated with Metro is monthly reporting on all of our SHS dollars, not just what's included in our corrective act act action plan. And that was uh, work that Antoinette and the finance team at the joint office had already begun under her leadership was ensuring that we have very tight uh, oversight of SHS uh, spending every month. And that's information that we'll be reporting to, to Metro uh, for greater transparency and, and greater accountability alongside them. We'll also uh, be looking specifically at what denotes cap completion. And for the vast majority of the priority programs and spending under the cap, the completion rate is 95% with the exception of housing Multnomah now because we expect that some of those dollars, specifically the rent assistance, might roll over into future years. So that'll be 80% for this year. We developed the, the cap with Metro in partnership. They're the funder and ultimately the, the oversight body. Um, so the process was uh, long and rigorous. Uh, and we did that with them and uh, will continue to work with them and have a cadence for regular meetings among finance and program team um, as we work through the cap moving forward. I also want to widen the aperture a little bit and provide a little bit of context into uh, where the region is in relationship to spending uh, as of the end of quarter three. And I provide the context just to show a little bit uh, more about where Multnomah County is and not to take away from the accountability uh, to you, to taxpayers, to Metro as the funder, to the community, to providers, but ultimately to the people who need our services. So between year one and year two, in the first three quarters, the spending and deliverables under SHS increased threefold. In the first three quarters of this year, 
Multnomah County spent more than we spent in all of last fiscal year. So as the program, as the dollars and funds come into our community, funding is increasing. And in quarter four, and Antoinette will talk a little bit about this uh, as we move forward in the presentation, but in the final quarter of this fiscal year, we saw tremendous spending increases in growth as new programs come on, came online, more uh, housing opportunities that we had commitments for opened, and we expect to continue seeing uh, increases in spending uh, as we move into this fiscal year. So we're not, Multnomah County, uh, part of this is we, we committed to spending 100% of our allocation for this fiscal year, and that's what drove the cap, or last fiscal year, I'm sorry. That's what drove the cap. The other counties uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, commit to spending 100% of their allocation, and they met their spending goals, which uh, didn't require a cap from them, but the, the carryover among the three counties uh, looks very similarly, and in fact, Multnomah County has the smallest amount of carryover and spent the greatest percentage of our funds last year. Next slide. This timeline displays how the budget process did not align with the cap. So starting with number one on the timeline, in June 2022, funding of $107 million was approved for SHS for FY23. This included $16.3 million carried over from previous fiscal year. Step two, or timeline two, in December 2022, an additional 3.3 33.4 million of unspent funds from FY22 were added in the FY23. This is, this is from the leftover budget of FY22, collections that exceed expectations for the same year. The board approved to increase the budget appropriation in the SHS fund by 28.4 million of one-time only funds. In February 2023, the budget for FY24 was submitted, allocating 119 million for SHS funding this amount included 23 million of underspent spending from FY23, which was incorporated in the 24 submitted budget. Around the May and June of 2023, the budget for FY24 was adopted, allocating 136.7 million for SHS funding. This included 40 million of underspending from FY23. During this time, it became apparent that the underspend was more than initially um, submitted. A five, however, the development of the corrective action plan process began by Metro, which started in June 14, 23, was in the process parallel to the adoption of the county budget for FY24. By the time Metro and the county began the CAP process, the county had already approved their budget. So furthermore, uh, FY23, the joint office year in, will conclude on August 31st of 2023, and the final numbers are expected to be updated in the CAP once the fiscal year officially closes. Next slide, please. FY3, uh, the next slide, please, sorry. The estimated SHS underspend for FY23 is 58.4 million, which is reflected in our cap. Here are the underspend priority areas. Emergency shelter, 8.8 million, uh, it's considered for the city Portland temporary alternative shelter sites, severe weather supplies, and sh shelter strategic capital. Number two, housing commitments, 14.4 million is for dedicating housing, initiatives such as housing Monoma now and master leases. Three, regional coordination, 14.8 to support regional investment strategies. Five, uh, uh, for rent assistance, 10 million to provide rent assistance to individuals in need. Five, uh, reserves and contingencies, 5.7 million to be set aside as reserve and contingencies. Lastly, system investments, 4.8 million for various investments, including technical assistance, capacity building, organizational health grants, clean start, and the 2% contract COLA in FY23 to mirror the general fund. While some of these items have already been adopted in the FY24 budget, totaling uh, 40 million, there are still some factors to consider. 
a reconciliation of the FY24 budget will be presented to the board in late August to determine the final underspend amount at the end of this year. It is important to note the 58.4 is subject to change and it, it is a conservative estimate. Investments, investments made in FY23, such as the technical assistance and 2% contract COLAs will be reflected in the final invoices from providers. We are currently awaiting these invoices. If the estimate uh, underspend exceeds the approved 40 million in FY24 budget, the board will need to take action. Conversely, if the underspin falls below 40 million, we may need to utilize additional unanticipated revenue in FY23 to cover the expenses in the FY24 budget. In concluding this slide, the 58.4 uh, million underspin requires careful monitoring and flexibility in our budget process. We'll continue to assess, assess the situation. Next slide, please. And that is my slide. All right. So I think up until this point, we've really talked about background, you know, the cap process, budget and numbers, and I want to be able to translate that a little bit to programmatic um, investments that we've already completed. So the goal of this slide is to really be able to, to provide examples of underspending investments and just to be able to highlight some of those immediate investment areas that we've already, that have been underway. And so the focus of these investments were really with existing providers, organizations to expand current services and address and close the existing service gaps. One of those categories, as Antoinette mentioned, was in technical assistance and organizational capacity building. So really targeting investments in agencies and the workforce that's really necessary to be able to deliver the services, really with the intention to strengthen our provider networks and the overall homeless you know, system of care. Um, this is also one of the LIP phase one goals, so really to be able to prioritize um, investments that will build system capacity, especially for new and emerging organizations so that they can also build their own organizational capacity as they're taking on new and expanding programs. So, the, um, so there was this increased investment in the following areas of human resource support, fiscal business services, strategic planning, program design, implementation, and evaluation. So what that really translates to is we have um, a provider agency that hired an equity consultant to be able to support the recruitment of BIPOC staff and the retention of BIPOC staff. Also, we heard back from our providers being able to utilize this organizational capacity for the overall just recruitment, retention, um, and maintenance of staff to be able to deliver the services to the community. Also, new infrastructure in fiscal, um, fiscal and financial systems for agencies, data, um, uh, data res uh, excuse me, data infrastructure for organizational stability. And so I think it's an important, though we've done technical assistance and organizational capacity building throughout the year, we also targeted increased investments with the underspend, um, like I said, to be able to respond to our provider community and being able to address those gaps. Another area of focus was on rent and client assistance. So really expanding current services um, that increase the deployment of rent and client assistance with the underspend. And so a couple examples I wanna highlight is with um, the expansion of our barrier mitigation services to be able to support you know, expungement filings, landlord and rent debt settlements. And this funding has allowed for an additional 250 clients to be served. Also an expansion of our behavioral health crisis vouchers for individuals served through the behavioral health division programming at the uh, crisis call center and at Project Respond. This additional funding served 25 individuals. And then also, um, I just wanna quickly note, the expansion of client assistance was really valuable. So um, expansion in day services for you know, to be able to provide additional bus tickets, hygiene kits, move-in kits, food, um, access to community warehouse. Um, and also we saw an increase in uh, some community groups, like I think there was a cooking class, one of the providers chatted about coffee clubs. So being able to utilize this underspend investments and being able to expand some of these services uh, towards the end of the year. And then also, I just want to know another kind of a great expansion in client assistance with our chat teams. And so the chat teams are our coordinated housing access teams, being able to really support um, individuals in the community with, you know, obtaining cell phones, birth certificates, um, housing supplies, 
groceries, storage units, um, move-in costs, application fees. So the varied use of this funding enabled chat case managers to better meet the needs of their caseloads. And then lastly, another investment area is in provider and system support. And so being able to increase system access and navigation to services. And so the underspend, one of the other targeted um, expansions was being able to print an additional 100,000 um, Rose City resource guides that were distributed to 426 groups. And then lastly, another example I want to ground us in is with our permanent supportive housing buildings. Um, being able to utilize this one-time funding has allowed for buildings to address a number of maintenance issues that were preventing the buildings from reaching full capacity. So I appreciate you all giving me a space to make, you know, I, th I feel like being able to have this presentation have a holistic framework where we're hearing the budget and numbers side, but also being able to translate that into the service delivery and programmatic elements of, of the measure. Next slide, please. The updated revenue forecast. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to provide you with an overview of Metro's forecast discussed during the June 26 meeting at the SHS Oversight Committee. During this meeting, the revised forecast for FY23 was presented. We learned that Metro, the regional government agency, is expecting to collect $325 million in tax revenue in FY23. This amount exceeds their budget by $100 million primarily due to payments for tax year 2020 made during FY23. This increase in revenue is a reflection of the widespread income growth experienced after the pandemic. Initially, the forecast in November 2021 in the first column estimated a total revenue of 200.1 million for the three counties and Monoma County amount was 90.8 million. However, a subsequent forecast conducted between April through June of 2023 predicted an increase in revenue. According to this updated forecast, Multnomah County was forecast to generate 135.6 million, totaling 299.1 million across the three counties. As a result of column three, indicates 44.9 million unanticipated one-time only revenue for Multnomah County, County totaling 99 million across the three counties. So I just wanna note that Metro is responsible for controlling and establishing this forecast for the counties. Metro is responsible for making necessary adjustments. Currently, Metro is analyzing tax year 2020 data to gather more information and the counties will have that information at a later date. It could be beneficial for Metro to conduct a board briefing on the SHS forecasting, similar to how the county presents the general fund forecast. This will provide us with an understanding of the forecast for years to come. Next slide. So this, this provides just a short kind of snapshot of what uh, the next six weeks or so are going to look like in this process. Uh, so June 26th, again, that was the day we received official notification from Metro of the unanticipated revenue. July 20th is today. Uh, and then over the next uh, several weeks, uh, we will engage uh, the uh, commissioners, you and your offices, as well as other stakeholders, the joint office, um, in kind of soliciting concept ideas, investment areas, uh, and proposals for uh, essentially the best next use of the unanticipated revenue. And then, as the chair mentioned in her opening remarks, we'll bring this back uh, to the board in, at the end of summer uh, for board action. So Dan and Kanoi uh, are shortly going to talk a, in a little bit more specificity about what the next steps are going to look like. Um, I just want to flag a few things as we start to, to think about the um, unanticipated revenue. Metro has been explicit that we should uh, consider the unanticipated revenue uh, to be one time only, rare, and unique. And that is their language, and that is how we are approaching it. Uh, the one-time only nature of these funds coupled with the end of COVID era investments like ARP and, and one-time only investments in this fiscal year um, in the joint office budget, we believe demand that we are disciplined in how we make decisions about these investments moving forward. 
as we continue to see housing placement work and significant increases in the number of people who are moving directly from our streets and our shelters back into housing, the year-over-year -year investment and cost to keep people housed will continue to be uh, significant and will grow as we continue to invest new resources and dollars to help people moving off or who are sleeping on the streets tonight move back into housing out of shelter back into housing and help them stay there and finally as we see our county partners across the region starting to increase their investments we expect that the regional response and shift in how and where people receive services will change and we welcome that and we'll continue to building up our services so we can do the best that we can on behalf of the people that we are tasked to serve. Next slide, please. Thank you, Stacy. I'm Dan Field, Director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Really pleased to be here today. And as we transition into next steps and ultimately into questions, I want to just make a few overarching remarks. Um, first of all, I just want to really honor the expertise at, at the table here. And I think um, uh, we also had strong support from our Chief Operating Officer and our Chief Budget Officer, uh, particularly in the Corrective Action Plan. It's been a very confusing few months as we've had the uh, transition from one budget year to the next fiscal year and the Metro Corrective Action Plan overlaying that and then on top of that the additional unanticipated revenue. So what we've tried to do this morning is, is walk you through that and I know you'll have a lot of questions. I also just want to observe going all the way back to the start of the Chair's remarks, her commitment to doing this work in a different way. And I will say, as somebody new to the office, we've seen what happens when this work is held too close, both within the joint office and within county leadership. And I just want to acknowledge that what we're trying to demonstrate here today, both the folks up here, uh, the folks standing behind us, the folks up here, that the conversations we're going to have uh, today and throughout uh, this month and next, is to reflect a different approach to this work. This is really complex work, and I know all of you will have some really challenging questions. Uh, you're hearing from constituents and stakeholders. You're trying to translate that into policy. And we're here as your staff to make that happen. So let's do this work together. Um, as we look at next steps, uh, I'm just going to reiterate a couple of things that hopefully you, you picked up along the way. Antoinette talked about the year-end close to finalize the underspending target. That doesn't happen until late August. The corrective action plan is tied to a specific number that we won't know until August. So part of what you saw was the challenge of, of landing plans when you don't know the final number. Um, so that's why there's some flexibility, and we talked about potentially as low as 40 or as, as high as 58. But we're prepared to navigate that uncertainty. Uh, that will resort, result potentially, again, as Antoinette said, in a budget modification coming to the board in late August or early September. We'll follow the same process where you have a chance for input and questions ahead of time on that before a vote. Um, finally, when we have the final budget number at the end of August, we will be able to finalize the corrective action plan for FY23. And of course, that needs to go back to Metro and to the uh, Supportive Housing Services Oversight Committee. The part we're going to um, dive into today, and, and I know many of you have already um, been engaged in this. We're meeting with uh, Commissioner Jayapal later this afternoon to talk about any area that she's passionate about that may or may not result in a funding decision, but those are the kinds of conversations that Stacy and other colleagues are already having with you and with the, with the chair. So that's that middle block there. We're gonna engage with all of you or each of you on the unanticipated revenue investment priorities. Um, building on what Stacy said, the first thing we have to do is just acknowledge the parameters of our work. We have one-time only funding. Uh, we've got a stable, stabilize previous commitments that we've made. Uh, we have an ARP cliff potentially, and I think um, Stacy and others um, have been really clear about let's keep an eye on that and let's not get caught off guard and be having a very different conversation a year from now. Uh, we will have the opportunity to explore new investments for the current fiscal year. The parameters we will use there with you as our policy leaders is we need to be grounded in the LIP, as Kanoi mentioned, and we have to be grounded in the, the regional supportive housing services measure goals and I think we're familiar with that um, 
we have existing priorities. We're not doing this from scratch. We have for several years now existing a joint office identified, um, reflected by the, the county commission, um, priorities and proposals, so we'll be honoring that. And then on top of that, finally, we'll have the opportunity to look at new priorities and new proposals. We know uh, our community and the environment is changing dramatically uh, from year to year, and we wanna recognize that. So just very tactically, uh, just to conclude here on next steps, we will bring, be bringing your recommendations, recommendations from the community, and recommendations from our, our staff and program managers uh, back to the chair over the next month. The chair will bring that to the commission. We'll do <clears throat> many of that, those conversations individually. And then of course, we'll have collective board action by the end of the summer. So I think with that, unless any of my colleagues have additional comments, we'll turn it over to questions. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation as well as for all of the work that has gone in. This has been a really long and ongoing process and I appreciate that. I appreciate um, that this is really our chance to, to kick off and then I think the next engagement where we're digging in um, into the details, but I think you've done a great job of, of setting up a, um, a good foundation for us and thinking about how you are thinking about these investments, how the conversations with Metro have gone. It's really interesting always to hear kind of the background on what's happening in the other counties and their spending as we're as we're contemplating this work and what we're being required to do at Multnomah County. Um, I know that Commissioner Stegman needs to leave at 11 a.m. So I'm going to go ahead and start. We're going to go in reverse order today so that you have a chance to ask your questions. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much uh, for the presentation today. I thought it was very clear and concise uh, and helpful. Uh, and also want to acknowledge uh, the Chair's office office's effort to be more transparent with the board uh, and really you know, digging down into a level um, that um, sometimes we don't always have access to. So I just wanna call that out. And Stacy, you've been really great about walking me through uh, many of the details as Dan has. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there. I I'm just gonna rattle off some things. <laughs> so who's ever taking notes? So I'm gonna just start with like, Here's what I would like <laughs> in the money. Uh, maybe some programming for the East County Homeless Service site. I know that's a little bit down the pike. Uh, for many of you that don't know, we bought uh, the employment office on 190th and Stark in Gresham. That building needs some work. I know Dan and I have uh, looked at it and we're trying to think about how we can make that site a place that just doesn't warehouse people but actually uh, provides a pathway for folks out of homelessness. So uh, whatever type of programming, uh, and I don't know if it would have to come out of that pot of money. It could come out of our next year's budget because I know it, there's a, a, a runway, it's gonna take some time. Uh, the other thing I think that I would like to look at is uh, Portland's time, place, and manner and the impact that that will have on East County cities and the resources that currently do not exist in East County. And we can only imagine and think about, you know, and try to plan for that. And I know that I think we're gonna be getting a presentation, but just wanted to make sure that we're, we're tracking that. Uh, other East County cities have mentioned things to me like bus passes and transportation to the East County Homeless Service site. Troutdale's a long ways to Gresham if you're on foot. So uh, whether that's uh, public transit or a shuttle, something like that. I've already mentioned hygiene, laundry, uh, things like that, storage services, uh, obviously day center, uh, and maybe, and I, and I know we have a mobile health uh, center, so maybe that can be something. Uh, we've also talked a lot about the master leases. I'm very concerned that that money hasn't gone out the door. I think it's a great program if we can execute on it. So maybe once we can execute on it, we should look at increasing that amount of money. The HOPE team, uh, Dan, I know you've been talking to the East County Cities. There's been some challenges with the navigators there. There's also been interest in having uh, maybe clinicians or beefing up that team, but let's, let's get it going first uh, and then maybe think about adding on to that team. Uh, and then finally, uh, working with Bienestar around uh, prevention, preventative rental assistance, what they call non-eviction. Mm -hmm. You all know that 
you know, it's, and we are helping people. Vienna Star currently goes to the courthouse, works with people that have received evictions, but we also know that if you're working with people before they get an eviction, it's a lot, lot less expensive. And so I've shared a proposal with the chair's office and with you all, it's around a $7 million ask around prevention rental assistance. Uh, okay, so now I just want to go into my questions. <laughs> so I, mean, I guess I'm really frustrated that, Stacy, what I hear you saying is that, so Metro said, Multnomah County, you all were supposed to spend 100% of your money. Other counties, they said they were only going to spend whatever, 80%. We said we were we, going to spend 100%. We said we said we're going to, okay. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, okay, okay, that, but the measurements still, but I mean, I find it really fascinating that you're saying that ultimately we ended up spending out a larger percentage than the other counties. Uh, yes, I mean, carrying over fewer dollars year to year. year right. Per, forecasted from 23 to 24. Okay, yeah. so anyway, I mean, I guess I'm just kind of concerned. It seems like an accounting, a snapshot, you know, it's kind of like in the private industry, <laughs> in my business as an insurance agent, it's like you can have a bad quarter or even a bad two quarters, but really what you're looking at is the entire year. So I'll just put that out there. Um, let's see, really excited. Uh, Chair, thank you so much. Uh, we were out at the, the task sites, a temporary alternative shelter site. Glad to hear that there's some funding going into that program with City of Portland. Uh, and so I did wanna ask when we talked about if our estimates are off, and I think somebody mentioned 40 to 58 million, uh, that we may have to backfill. And when I looked at slide nine, it said ARP funding for 2024 was about 19 million. So has somebody kind of figured out, okay, how much should we be planning uh, for the ARP money that's going away? And what is that dollar figure? Um, I think right now we're still assessing that and, and we'll have more to come later on on that question, but that's an excellent question. Okay, very good. All right, I'll look, I'll look for for that. Uh, Commissioner Segment, um, I also, this has also been a part of the conversations that we're having with the city as well, because some of the dollars that they're putting into the joint office um, are, is also ARP money too. Okay. So as we're looking, we're looking kind of across the board for both city and county right. for those dollars. Okay, because I mean, I think it's kind of hard for us to sit up here and say, well, we want X amount here, here, and here, but we don't know how much we're gonna have to backfill. Mm -hmm. So obviously we've got to know how much we have to backfill, what's left over mm -hmm. to spend. So I'll, I, I look forward uh, to having the, those conversations. Um, and Kanoi, on slide 12 to 13, sometimes I get confused because like we, we called different things, maybe later if mm -hmm. you could just crosswalk slide 12 with slide 13. And you know, like we have these topics and I don't always understand, sure. you know, then we hear the program offers and I'm like, okay, which bucket does this, this fall into? It's, it's not a big deal, but when you talked about um, you know, like emergency shelter, where does, does technical, technical assistance, rent and client provider system support, which buckets do those mm -hmm. fall into on slide 12? Yes, I understand what your question, yeah, yeah. To translate so it, it for you, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, you don't have to do it, but that would just be really helpful because you all, I mean, you're in the trenches and you, you live and breathe this work and sometimes there's multiple terminologies for the same thing and I'm going, wait, now, is that the same thing? So sure. anyway, it was a really great presentation and um, I just appreciate all of you and all of the folks in, in the joint office who um, do this work day in and day out and it has been rough and I think it goes back to the briefing we received from Metro that there was this misnomer that the supportive housing services measure was gonna solve homelessness. Unfortunately, uh, it is not going to solve homelessness. It was meant to have a big impact but I do think it's important that we have the appropriate expectations as we move forward. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. And uh, I guess I'm just gonna start with a couple of framing comments and I have a fair number of questions. Um, and I guess the, the first just framing comment, I'm just concerned that we got the presentation this morning at 6.39 a.m., uh, which didn't really allow a lot of time to um, review it in advance. Um, 
And I appreciate that I'm new, um, but I also feel that um, we have a broader community that we um, need to demonstrate transparency to. And so um, just having information in advance um, so that, um, I say, I, I think um, we have a lot of work to do in terms of demonstrating transparency and accountability to the broader community, and we can do that by providing information far to, far enough in advance. Um, and I also hope that a lot of our conversations um, around how the money will be spent will happen at our commission meetings um, versus just one-on-one -on -one individual meetings. I mean, personally, I'll benefit from hearing um, from my fellow commissioners um, in areas where they think there is priorities um, and I also think the public benefits by better understanding how we're gonna um, designate some uh, of the, the funds that are coming in. Um, just in terms of the framing, um, and again, this is partly because I'm new, but having things framed in terms of a spend, and I totally appreciate um, the point about um, Multnomah County being held to a different standard. Um, also, I'm concerned if we are framing things in our conversation with the community as a spend down plan, um, and not part of a comprehensive um, plan that that frames it in the sense not of we're successful if we spent all the money versus we're successful if we achieved X, Y, and Z um, objectives um, to transition people off the street. So th this is again like a, a framing of how we talk about it um, versus just did we spend the money and we're successful if we spend all the money. Because um, I'm, sh I'm sure we can, I'm sure we can do that. Um, and the other, just overarching comment is when I go through the presentation, um, this speaks a little bit to the, the, the crosswalking um, of each of the individual buckets of being able to see it, what is, say, on the, the slide that has the slide 12 that has all the underspend priority areas. Mm -hmm. Um, emergency shelters, like how much emergency shelter are we, we purchasing? Um, when are we going to be purchasing that? So just so that we know exactly how that money is going to be earmarked, what, we, what, what success looks like um, in terms of individuals, again, uh, versus just did we spend the money um, and, and the timeline. Um, and, you know, again, I'd hope that we also in our terms of our conversation, look at the sort of not just metros told us we need to do this, so we're doing it, but look at it in the terms of like our, as we think ahead, the IGA um, conversations with the city, like how this how that this fits with that, um, also how it fits with. Um, I'm glad you mentioned um, the city's uh, time, place, and manner um, implementation. We are going to have a presentation next week, but what is that going to mean for? Um, needed county services and how are we matching some of these funds um, with with that? Uh, so I'll now get to my my questions, but those are some just overarching framing of what I'm going to want to see before. I have, go ahead. I responded to two things before you move on to the questions. Um, one, uh, your your point about timing, so noted. Uh, that's totally fair. I, I do want to um, say that recognize that. Um, is a result of a lot of hard work and a lot of late hours prior, primarily by my three colleagues here and others in the audience. That's not the norm and that's not the standard that we aspire to, but uh, the quality of the presentation I thought was very high and that required a lot of long hours. I also would note that the presentation this morning is designed to frame the conversation going forward. There's no vote or board action requested today, so, um, um, but your point is still noted. Second thing, just quickly. I just uh, respond to that is, yeah. I, and I say this because I always, um, having been a staffer, I know how much work goes behind the scenes. Like we may see um, a, pr a presentation of 20 slides and just the amount of total staff time. Um, and I wanna respect that staff time by um, having the time to review it and understand it um, versus showing up unprepared. So that, that's why I asked that. It's really wanting to respect yeah. all the work that, that I know what happened behind the scenes. Yeah, totally taken in that spirit, and thank you. You uh, the first two commissioners both mentioned response to time, place, and manner. 
we're not ready to present on that today, but I do want to acknowledge that Kanoi and the broader team have been uh, diving into that, preparing a list of investments that are very specifically targeted uh, to respond to the ordinance. I think uh, the chair and Stacy are also working on a larger county response. So that's not our focus today, but because both of you have raised it, just know that that is top of mind for us. Great. So, um I had a question about another document that we got last night. It was it's this attachment one. Is this the actual um, um, corrective action plan that's been agreed to with with Metro? That's the substantive document. So there's an MOU that we're still drafting um, with them as well. Is that, I was trying to crosswalk it presentation we got this morning um, and just curious about how those in interact. I also noticed that in my just, there's, there's not a tally, but I just roughly just went through here and it looks like it's for $67 um, million. And, and again, this is, you'll have to cor correct my math if I'm wrong, but the what I understood is that the commission in last year's budget or wasn't part of or the budget that 40 million of it had been approved and that, that not further approval needed, but that there, but that was 40 million and then anything over that, it would need to come back to the commission for approval. And so I'm wondering so if this is 67 million, what here is gonna come back to the commission for approval? And then I'm assuming there's some sort of uh, asterisk and that's not a legal term, but um, that if the, the county can't agree to um, a corrective action plan with things that haven't yet been approved by the commission or it's um, that the agreement is contingent upon approval by the county commission of those things that haven't already been authorized? Sorry, that was a long question, but hopefully. It was a robust question. <laughs> um, we have tentative agreement with Metro. And so I do know that what was approved in the budget um, was shared over uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, specifically of the the carryover that uh, the joint office identified during the budget process. I can reshare that today so you can you can see that. Um, with regard to can I just say something? It, yep. Just so there's one set of documents and the because things tend to be named different things, um, is if this is the, what's going to be um, ten is tentatively agreed to with Metro to go through this list and what what has already been authorized and what would be coming back. Sure, we can do that. Because um, that will be helpful to know um, yeah. where, where the discretion still is. Um, because I'm, I'm assuming that the forty million that can be because it's already been authorized, but the whatever hasn't been that it would come back and it still would be require approval by the commission. Got it. We'll do that. We'll, we'll come back that, on yes. that. So I'm gonna. Um, we have to move on to Commissioner Jaya Paul now, just to, to keep for the time. I'm, I'm, I know you have a lot of questions. We we're going to have a lot of discussion about this. We have Commissioner Rubio here who has a um, for the next agenda item who has a hard stop. That we so we need to make sure that we get through that item, and I want to make sure that Commissioner Dyer Paul and Commissioner Myron have the time for their questions. So, um, if there's um, things that you can put in writing, we can add those to the conversation and make sure you get the information you need. And then, as you have said, um, uh, that we will we're going to be having a, several different conversations at, as ongoing with this as well. So I'm happy to do that. Also, my my questions. Um, I think when we have substantive work and I, I want to be also um, respectful of my colleagues but I also think that we need to be having and I didn't see it on the snapshot that we'd be having future um, conversations so I'm glad to hear that's going to happen um, but I, I do think our community has given us a lot of resources and the expectation that something it, that we're going to use those effectively and that we should have time to have the conversations in public when I say I'm happy to send my questions in but um, I also think I'd like to see how we're going to have this conversation over the next several months, not just um, in private briefings. Um, so I'm happy to send my questions. 
Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I just want to want to start with some recognition of all of the hard work that's gone into this over the past many weeks by the Chair's office. Uh, Stacy, Antoinette, welcome to the team. I'm really glad to have you in this position. Kanoi and, and Dan. Uh, yeah, you know, it's been complicated. The timing makes it complicated. The relationship with Metro makes it complicated. Um, so, so lots of appreciation for the hard work. Um, also, want to appreciate some of the remarks you made, Dan. I really appreciated your remarks about a different approach. I have already seen that both with you and your team, with the chair's office, in terms of opening up the process, um, including to the rest of the commissioners, and um, engaging earlier and more often. So, very much appreciate that. Stacy, I appreciate your comments about the big picture on regional spending. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think um, this is truly a regional effort. And so it's not a matter of saying um, one county is doing something well and another county is not doing something well. But we do need to have a consistent approach about how we are um, both budgeting and then monitoring the spending of these funds. And I think there is an inconsistency in the IGA and the role that it creates for Metro um, on the one hand, imposing corrective action plans, and I think that spend down language, I agree with you, that that's not great language. I think it comes from Metro and the IGA, right? It's their language. Yeah, so, so but, but there's an inconsistency between the approach when a county doesn't spend what it's budgeted, and we all agree that we have got to be, underspending is not okay. I mean, you know, it, it can happen, and it can happen for justifiable reasons. In this case, um, it, th there's too much underspending, and, and there were issues, I think, with, as I've come to understand, with sort of financial monitoring and controls, and we are getting a handle on those. But there's an inconsistency between how it's approached when a county doesn't spend what it budgeted and what counties are budgeting in the first place. And I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's an important regional, it's an important conversation to have with Metro and with the other counties um, to, to figure out uh, how collectively we are both creating appropriate realistic budgets and then spending to those budgets. So I uh, appreciate your comments about that. Um, I do, I, I want to echo a request that Commissioner Brim Edwards made, which is a crosswalk to what's already in the budget. Um, I've seen different iterations of it, and I do think a really clear crosswalk would be, would be helpful. So I want to make a couple of comments about um, the way I'm thinking about the use of these funds, again, recognizing the awkwardness of the fact that there has been a process with Metro that is now coming to, to us, you know, and it's, it's uh, I've said many times, and uh, I'm sorry, Stacy, for repeating myself on many things, but one has been, it would have been more sense to be thinking about underspend and unanticipated in, in one bucket so that we can make trade-offs some funds can be spent in particular ways so that we could make trade-offs, you know, look at it all together. We'll ultimately get there because we're approving both sets of funding at the same time, but the process of developing the proposals for underspend is very different from the process of mm -hmm. developing the proposals for unanticipated, mm -hmm. and it's, it's awkward, to say the least. Um, but, you know, as I think about how these funds should be spent, that, that one time only, and I actually really like Metro's phrase, rare and unique, is really, really important. Um, and figuring out how to spend this volume of money that's one time only responsibly is hard. Mm -hmm. I, I think we should be very careful about spending it for services because services are typically not one time only. They can be one time only potentially if we're thinking about it as a pilot, um, but in general they're not. So, you know, that's one of the, that's sort of my, has been my primary criteria as I think about how do we spend these effectively. And, and the priorities I'll outline, there is overlap between what, what I've been thinking about and what I see in the proposal around the underspending. Provider capacity is key. Mm -hmm. We know that's why, in large part, we weren't able to spend to budget. And so it is entirely logical and um, vital that we spend a significant amount of this money on provider capacity. And I, you know, I, I might have, I'll have specific questions about the proposals, but um, I think that piece of it is really important, whether that's hiring or retention or infrastructure and, you know, building an infrastructure that way. I think eviction prevention is a really important piece and one that is consistent with one-time only funding or can be. 
Um, and I think of that in two buckets. One is rent assistance, but rent assistance is specifically targeted to eviction prevention. And I'll mm -hmm. make a distinction about other kinds of short-term rent assistance. Because when it's targeted to eviction prevention, we can effectively use short-term rent assistance to do that. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then eviction representation, I think, is another category that fits well with the use of one-time only funding. Because again, we can provide eviction representation in a one-time only way. And my team has been working on a proposal for that and we'll bring that forward. So using rent assistance, rapid rehousing rent assistance, I, I have more qualms about using this funding for rapid rehousing rent assistance. I have more qualms about because I don't think it's clear how effective rapid rehousing, which is short-term rent assistance, is in sustainably housing people coming out of chronic homelessness. And if we're gonna use it for that perspective, and you and I have talked about it, Tracy, but I just wanna say it publicly, if we're gonna use it for that purpose, we have got to be making um, provision for the fact that we'll likely have to continue that. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the things that we've done, move in Multnomah, for an example, lots of great things came out of move in Multnomah, but it was 12 months of rent assistance, and there was a cliff. And then we had a bunch of people who needed more rent assistance. So I just think we have to be careful about using significant amounts of this one-time only money in a short-term rent assistance way. Um, I think capital investments are one of the best and most logical uses for this one-time only money. And there's a range of capital investments. I am not wedded to one or the other. We have some ideas, but buying things and building up our physical infrastructure capacity, that is a one-time only purchase. Uh, purchase we do have to make provision later on then for services, but I, you know, so I, I recognize that, mm -hmm. but I think there is a way to effectively use this money for those types of capital investments. And I'm thinking about transitional spaces, which we don't have a lot of. I'm thinking about hotel, you know, motel uses. There, while we haven't done our own evaluation and we need to about the effectiveness of our motelling work, there's research from around the country that says that that's a really cost effective and effective in terms of moving people on into permanent housing um, strategy. So I, I, I think we should be sort of doubling down on that. We're doing a lot of motelling. The question I've consistently had about our motel work is that we're leasing. And I, I question the long term, if you know, sort of fiscal um, impact of leasing versus buying. So my question around motels has not been the cost of motel conversions. I, I think they are actually relatively cost effective, but it's the lease versus buy question that I've had on motels. So transition spaces, recovery spaces, motel, and then preservation of affordable housing. And then I'll add one more specific category. Um, there's a group of um, LGBTQ organizations that have done some research on what the LGBTQ community needs and they've identified the need for transitional and shelter spaces specific to LGBTQIA plus folks as, as a real gap. So I think there's an opportunity there that we could take advantage of. Day center spaces, others have mentioned it. I think that that's, that, is, that could be a terrific use. And then I think both commissioners Stegman and um, Bram Edwards have mentioned responses to the city's time, place, and manner ordinance. And I appreciate the fact that you're working on that, but that absolutely has to be one of the categories that we look at. So those are, those are some of the, my priorities. Um, I have some questions, I'll follow up on them, but I'll tell you a couple of the categories. Move in Multnomah, I, I did not understand the proposal for move in Multnomah. I talked about leasing rooms, didn't understand that, that wasn't what move in Multnomah was, so I'll have some questions about that. Um, and then I have questions about the Doug Fur piece. It's not a big piece, it's less than $2 million, but I think as a policy matter, as I understand what that is, it is setting aside funds for a rent guarantee that goes on beyond the period of the SHS measure. I think that was a huge policy decision that was made by somebody at some point that was not brought to this board, um, and I question it. So I question using money in this proposal for that as well. Um, I, and then I have some smaller questions around other pieces of it, but I wanted to call those out. So I, I, I will stop with that. More to come. Thank yes, you. there will definitely be yes. more to come. Thank yep. you, Commissioner Doyle Paul. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, 
it's hard for me to begin with this because um, I had prepared some questions and comments and I hope to sort of fill those in and tweak them during this presentation. Um, and I'm left with way, way more questions and comments than I can possibly get to today. Uh, I know that you spent a lot of time preparing for this, and I really appreciate the time and dedication. Um, Stacy, I appreciate the time you've taken to really reach out and, um, you know, over the past uh, week or two to just try to inform me and my office about what's going on. But what I'm left with is that this is a mess. Um, we heard about cooking classes and coffee clubs for a couple of people while Rome is burning. Um, I, I will probably end up just reading my prepared comments and questions because um, there's too much that I am feeling and need to digest before responding to some of what was here. But I will speak to a couple of what my fellow commissioners said. Uh, Commissioner Stegman commented uh, that the SHS measure, we need to have expectations be real. It's not supposed to end homelessness. No, of course not. But it is a billion dollars to address chronic homelessness, by and large, for a population of chronically unsheltered homeless people of a few thousand people in our community. And that problem is getting worse with investment of hundreds of millions of dollars. That's a problem. And that's not a mismatch between, you know, oh, we have to kind of set up expectations. We are not fulfilling our obligation to the county, period. To Commissioner Brim Edwards' comments, I just want to say I agree with pretty much everything you said. In terms of the process, like I said, I felt I was prepared, having had a couple of briefings of it, about this, seeing some um, emails go back and forth, but what we got this morning wasn't what I was expecting, and to get the presentation at 6 a.m. or whatever time is not sufficient time to really absorb and ask questions. So I, I appreciate it that you, you heard that and that you will um, respond to that process question. I also feel that these issues are probably the most important issues to our community, and yet it concerns me we're cut short in having open and transparent conversation, even though it's reflect, you know, you say this is a priority. If that's such a priority, why did we cancel our briefing on Tuesday that was scheduled for a brief. We could have had the conversation openly. I hope moving forward we don't have as many time constraints to be able to have the, con the transparent conversation amongst ourselves so that the community understands and can be part of, of what we're talking about um, moving forward. For Commissioner Jaipal, I agree about capital investments. Um, smart capital investments rather than what I do see us spending in facilities which are tremendous amounts of money for what it seems that we're getting, which is why I will be proposing Crown Plaza as a bargain for what we would get for that investment um, as part of the use of the $45 million of unanticipated revenue and potentially I'm still trying to work, I still don't understand quite the underspend, why that is not part of the greater conversation um, and that did not happen transparently. I did not find out about it until essentially it was released to the press that I didn't even hear Metro had said that there was a corrective action plan until it was almost, you know, it was public basically, and that we had responded, and then it took me forever to even get a copy of just like the emails of what, that are public records of what was said. Like, so I'm just absorbing a lot of this right now, 
And though I agree with some general buckets of what we could be thinking about to use some of this money on, the specifics that are in the corrective action plan from what I've seen are not something I've agreed to at all. And so I think there needs to be much more open and transparent board conversation. In terms of the LIP, I've heard it referred to as the plan and it's called a plan and I thought we had this conversation and there was intention to overhaul that LIP and revisit it because I challenge anyone watching or listening to this broadcast, anyone in the audience, look up the local implementation plan for the supportive housing services measure for Multnomah County, read it, and just tell me what you take from it as a plan and what you think the outcomes measures are for the billion dollars that we are spending on supportive housing services measure, measure. We need a public conversation about the LIP and I believe an overhaul and revisiting. My planned comments were, we need an open and transparent process to prioritize how this board spends the shocking amount of money we have related to underspending and unanticipated revenue for the Metro Supportive Housing Services measure. We are awash in funds, yet we talk more about how fast we can get money out the door or spend it, rather than think smartly about how we're using that money. And homelessness, meanwhile, is at an unprecedented high and people are dying on our streets from fentanyl. We do not have a plan around homelessness. We do not have a plan about spending the supportive housing services money. And so when we get this kind of money, we can't put it into a big picture because we don't have that picture to fit it into. And Chair, I know you campaigned on having a plan around homelessness and coming in with that, and I would still love to see it. I know that, um, uh, Director Field, you've come in and now you're working on creating a plan and operations, but I, I'm just going to say the word plan every, every board meeting at this point until we see one. And specifically what was brought up here today, one of the allocations is more money for housing Multnomah now. And when we promise that 300 people will be housed within a certain amount of time, and we house five. I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing, it's shameful, but it's not personal credibility of the chair whose proposal that was that's at issue here. It's the credibility of this board. So if we're not able to talk about, hey, what happened? What, five? Why didn't we get six? That would be 2% at least of 500. What are we doing? Um, that's not working. We need to talk about that and we need to ask the bigger question of 300? Why are we even talking 300? This is the moral question of, we're talking 300 when there's 6,000 people. That's a bigger question. So we set this artificially low bar to house people and then we don't even clear that by like orders of magnitude. So we need to be able to talk about that and what we're doing about it so we can restore trust and faith in what we're doing and we are a board. It reflects on all of us. And for me, I'm gonna put out there, you know, I, I'm going to propose $25 million of our $45 million of, under, or of unanticipated revenue. I propose that goes to funding the Crown Plaza. I've talked to, um, so many community members about it. I appreciate those who came in today and testified in favor of that. There are many more um, I know that are out there, but one of the most important missing links in a system that is a chain of missing links is recovery housing, bridge housing, you know, supportive housing, as you know, and supportive housing services measure. We have an opportunity to purchase outright a facility that's virtually move in ready that is a fraction of the cost of the things that the city and county have invested in 
that provide less, that can get people housed who've stabilized in Cooper Detox, from the Unity Center, from jail, from the state hospital, long term. We can buy it, we can plan for it, we can use it, and yet we don't discuss it. This is like a, a no-brainer to me, and I, I hope that we can have conversations about that because that is a great use of this money that has appeared. It's a big missing link. I also support, um, this is gonna go to behavioral health, we can use some of the metro, some of this money toward what are now described as conversations around the behavioral health emergency coordination network that I hope will be reframed, but toward a for treatment center for co-occurring illnesses because we can't just invest in treatment without the places for people to go because people are already discharged to the street. We need to do both of these things at the same time smartly. So invest in the treatment and then invest in the recovery housing and we might and make a plan and then we might start to see a difference. A um, lot more I'll provide it in writing and um, really appreciate your being here today. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate everything. We have um, Kipshar Rubiri here who I know needs to leave. Um, do you have a very quick follow up? So, okay, so go. quick, 30 seconds. Um, but I think something that would be really useful for me and I think for the whole board is for a summary of what we are permitted to spend SHS funds on. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to R2, but we were going to have lots more conversations about this money. Again, as a reminder, everyone, this was kind of the kickoff of the conversation where we can have the board's input. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. R2, Multnomah County's agreement with the City of Portland to increase the cap on numbers of applicants allowed within each fiscal year under the Home Buyer Opportunity Limited Tax Exemption Program to 500. Commissioner Myra moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of R2. Um, welcome to our guest from the city. I want to thank you all for being here. Commissioner Rubio, um, Interim Director Rogers, um, and thanks for all the work around the Holty program. We have seen over the years the impact that Holty has had on creating pathways to home ownership for our community members. Um, increasing applicants into this program is going to have such an important positive impact for our community. We know that increasing home ownership opportunity is really such a powerful like economic engine for our families to be creating um, paths to prosperity and stability. So I'm really um, glad that we're having this conversation today and I'm really pleased to turn it over to Commissioner Jayapal who's going to be kicking us off. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you so much um, for being here, all of you. Really excited about this um, and very much appreciate the city bringing it forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, th lots of reasons to support it, but one of the, the biggest ones is that I think we're all focused on finding permanent solutions for affordable and accessible housing for all county residents. Here at the county, we tend to focus on rental housing because that's what the majority of the people that we serve are, are, are in. Um, but increasing home ownership is obviously critical as well. I'll note that there is a 30% home ownership gap between white and black residents of the county and the demographic information that we've received that shows who's benefiting from the Holty program and ex other exemption programs indicate that we are reaching black and other people of color with these programs and we are helping to bridge the gap and that's incredibly important. Um, one of the other reasons we're excited about this is that at the county, we don't have a lot of levers for increasing actual built affordable housing. And so the chance, this is one of the levers that we do have, um, and the chance to partner with the city to do that, I think is, is really exciting. Um, I'm, in the long term, I think this program is gonna lead to greater regional affordability and wider access to wealth building assets in communities not currently being served by the market. One thing I'll note is that we did get estimates on what this is gonna, the lost revenue to the county, and it, it, it was estimated at $1,000 per property annually. With that number, this benefit seems well, well worth the cost. So again, wanna thank Commissioner Rubio, Acting Director Rogers, and the rest of the team for the program and for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Jayapal, and good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for having us here today. For the record, I'm Commissioner Carmen Rubio of the Portland City Council, and I wanna start by thanking you for passing a resolution last month uh, supporting an extension of the city's multi-program, which will help keep hundreds of renters in their homes. 
Today I'm here to discuss, um, excuse me, just one second, lost my part. Today I'm here to discuss another proposal recently adopted by the Portland City Council to expand one of the city's tools for affordable home ownership, the Home Buyer Opportunity Limited Tax Exemption Program, or HOLTI. And I'd like to provide you with some background on this change and why it matters. Over the past decade, the HOLTI program has helped more than 1,000 families achieve home ownership by offering an incentive for new family-sized homes that are sold to low and moderate income families. The HOLTI program does this by reducing the property taxes that homeowners pay for their first 10 years of ownership. And currently the city allows 100 newly constructed homes each year to apply for this program. And if those homes are sold to, and, and if those homes are sold to a family of up to 100 AMI. But we know that there is much, much more interest than availability. Our nonprofit and for-profit home builders recognize the benefit that this program provides. And when the applications for those 100 slots open up each, each July, they go very, very quickly. And as housing prices and interest rates rise and home ownership becomes more out of reach for Portland residents, it's clear that we need to do more, which is why my office has worked with the team at the Housing Bureau and our local housing organizations on a plan to expand the cap. The resolution in front of you today increases the annual application cap from 100 to 500 for the next three years so that more Portland families can access the stability and wealth building that home ownership offers. And Portland Housing Bureau will then review the program to see if this change is achieving our goals. And I'm particularly interested in seeing how this will help boost the production of town, townhouses and other family-sized middle housing options in areas impacted by the residential infill changes over the past years. And also it, how it will allow more black, indigenous, Latine, and other communities of color to take the next step and purchase their homes and begin to build wealth for their families. So today we're here to ask for your partnership to move this important change forward. And we have our expert staff here from the Portland Housing Bureau to provide a bit more detail on the proposal and whom will of course be happy to answer any questions that you have. So with that, I will turn it over to PHB's Interim Director, Molly Rogers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I am Molly Rogers. I'm the Interim Director of the Portland Housing Bureau and I use she, her pronouns. The HOLTI program pairs with other development incentive programs to support homeownership production for new family-sized homes affordable to low and moderate income home buyers. The current number of new HOLTIs Portland Housing Bureau can approve each year is capped at 100 for homes sold to home buyers earning up to 100% of the median area income. Nonprofit home builders such as Habitat for Humanity and Proud Ground that ensure long-term affordable home ownership for households earning up to 80% of area median income are exempt from this application cap. The application cap renews every year on July 1st on a first come first serve basis. Right now, within only just a few weeks in, we have already received 94 applications. In addition to home buyers needing to income qualify at the time of purchase, homes must sell below an annual sales cap, which is currently set at $455,000. At our last reporting year, we saw that the average family accessing the HOLTI program earned around 85% of the area median income, and they purchased a home for way less than the annual uh, cap at around $350,000. And most importantly, we saw that 74% of the home buyers were BIPOC households. Turn over to hold up. Oh, and we uh, go through the next slide. Pass on to the slide. Next slide, then, please. Um, hello, my name is Dori Hellier. I am the program manager of the development incentives. I'm happy to, to be before you, um, Chair and Commissioners. Um, just to provide kind of our, our next steps from this background, as sort of mentioned already, this request uh, from the home builders to expand the Holti 
cap aligns with state and city initiatives to reduce barriers and to expand de development capacity across Portland. And as Commissioner Rubio mentioned, council um, within the city of Portland has already voted in support of this increase to 500. So with this proposal, there's the three-year pilot for the increased cap, and that will, again, re allow for us to review the outcomes. We anticipate that this change would provide a pathway to home ownership for an estimated 650 additional families. And we do recognize that the cost of the Holdy program does impact tax revenue. However, the tax exemption applies only to the structure, the home, so that the land is still taxable. So when these no, new homes are built, the value of the underlying land increases, meaning that tax revenue will still increase from what was being assessed before the new construction. So in this case, even though it is foregone revenue, it's not existing revenue that we're taking away. Um, the city's portion of foregone property tax revenue is about 928 on average per year per, per home in line with the, the county estimate that you all have as well. And so during this three-year pilot, um, the Portland Housing Bureau will, will continue to evaluate the success of the expanded Holty program by the amount of family size, middle income, or middle housing homes produced, and the accessibility of the program to BIPOC communities. Thank you. And with that, we'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate all you being here. We'll go to the board for any questions. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thank you. Um, it's great if 650 more families can get access to housing. I have a couple questions and they're main, mainly just becoming familiar with, with it, if that's um, okay. So the waiver of taxes, is it just, so when you get your property tax bill on the back of the bill, there's that long list of, Port of Portland, Metro, Multnomah County, the city. Is it just the line item or is this a broader waiver of property taxes? So it's based on the improvement value. So um, the amount, uh, when you look at the whole assessed value of the property, it'll have the value for the land as well as then the improvements, the building in this case. And so the exemption applies across all of the taxing jurisdictions for that 10 year period on the improvement value. So that whole long list. Yes, included. Exactly. Um, and I hadn't anticipated that question before the meeting, but I probably should disclose that uh, potentially just as a, a volunteer member of the Portland School Board, um, that there would be an impact on the revenues um, of the jurisdiction that I sit in the school board. I serve in a volunteer capacity, so I don't think it's a conflict, but I just want to note that. Um, and to follow up, um, I guess the question I have is before this got brought here, did were the other jurisdictions, because um, there's a lot of them, <laughs> were they consulted about um, any sort of like revenue reduction? I know this was an issue earlier when um, you had urban renewal districts, the impact on other jurisdictions when um, exemptions were given. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Um, so in this particular instance, we have not uh, broadly engaged all of the particular taxing jurisdictions. Um, the statutory requirement for the program uh, does require that at least 51% of the taxing jurisdictions endorse any um, form of the program. And, and with that, the city and the county make you know, go beyond that 51%, and certainly that we don't want to make those decisions in isolation. But, um, and, and, and because the fact that this is not um, removing revenue from the schools, but sim simply delaying it for this period for the home buyers in question. Um, let's use an example maybe that's different from the school district just because um, I'm trying to understand more, understand it. Sure. So for example, it's a metro line item or the Port of Portland. Um, it's not actually deferred, it's not because, it's not like at the end of the exemption they would um, then get the money, it's actually they don't get the money in that particular year, but the tax, the tax will kick, kick in in future years, but they actually don't get that money for during the life of the exemption. Correct, for that 10 year period. Yeah. Um, just having 
served on multiple jurisdictions, while it sounds like we meet the 51% um, threshold, it seems like it would also, and that, uh, this doesn't seem like a material difference, but it would be probably as a courtesy to tell the other jurisdictions, um, just as they're going through their budget planning, that ch changes are being made, even though the city and county have the, sounds like, the ability to do it um, without informing the others. Um, so thank you for sharing that information. The other um, thing is in the resolution we have, um, it has states that half the home buyers using the program are from the Asian community. I'm wondering if we have the complete disaggregated data. Uh, sure, Commissioner, not with me today, but we do break it down, you know, based on the voluntary um, declaration of the of the applicants for the programs between the different communities, which we could certainly follow up with you on. Great. I'd like to s I'd love to see that. And then um, my last question is that since this is a, um, a 5X expansion from 100 to 500, um, that it says that um, the Housing Bureau will be reviewing the effects of the cap increase. And I'm just curious whether, instead of it being an internal evaluation, whether it'd be done just externally um, versus, or the city auditor doing it versus, or like a review versus um, having just an internal evaluation. I, th I think I know what you're, uh, Commissioner, uh, obviously, uh, as a public entity, we want to uh, be able to share our data and, and evaluate it so that you can all assess whether we're meeting our various goals. So the policy objectives is are we increasing you know, BIPOC homeownership? Are we increasing regenerational wealth? And are we, how much foregone revenue is that really assessing? Um, we do collect that data. We collect um, demographics, time of uh, application, and we do do a follow-up with the assessor's office, really understanding the tax impact. Um, happy to share, of course, um, uh, I'll, I'll defer to staff on when we do those periodic da data uh, reports, make sure you all get a, a, a copy of all that and, a, and an opportunity to weigh in and help us evaluate the effectiveness of that program. And I appreciate your comment about the other taxing jurisdictions. We'll absolutely do some outreach um, and make them aware of, of these components to Jory's point earlier, it, it will be a negligible uh, impact due to the fact that these are not existing homes. These are going to be new homes. And generally, it's all based on new construction. So it is uh, an overall, especially after 10 years, we will see a boon in revenue for, for both us and, and you and hopefully the um, other taxing jurisdictions. But that's the piece. Those are the components we need to really look at at a 10-year basis. Um, what are we all foregoing? Um, and uh, as a reminder, this will be a three-year pilot um, so that we want to really kickstart um, and really see what the demand is out there. Um, and and uh, home builders are telling us there's enough demand, but we want to make sure that there is before we come back and, and say this would be something beyond three years. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Jarpal. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I just want to appreciate the, the last clarification that you made, um, Director Rogers, about it's revenue foregone, not revenue lost. I think that's that's the distinction, so I appreciate that. Um, but I appreciate Commissioner Broom Edwards pointing out that we should let the other jurisdictions know about it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your all being here, and I do not have any questions either. Thanks. Thank you. Wonderful. Do we have any public comment on this? Uh, yes, we had one written testimony which was shared with board members and staff and one in-person testimony from Charles Johnson. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good morning still, and I'm still Charles Ridge Cranston Johnson. Johnson. Um, obviously this is R2 is a big yes, but I think there are a couple things we could call out in that, that really uh, across the river, in addition to the city hall where uh, Car Commissioner Carmen Ruby who brought this forth works, there's also a branch of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. And really, home ownership for BIPOC communities is an issue that requires an even bigger response than this. And so I hope that uh, you're in future communications with Carmen Rubio, you will work and make sure that the local person from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the U.S. Bank Regional Ch Vice Chairman, the Wells Fargo Vice Chairman have their feet held to the fire about improved investments for new construction for BIPOC communities. The other thing that's slightly on my mind, uh, biased towards my own community, 
uh, family homes. I hope that uh, uh, gay and lesbian couples who have chosen to have children are also uh, a statistic that is monitored in this program. Um, the, uh, I th hope, I think there's weird uh, demographic data about income disparities, so I don't think there'll actually be a lot of candidates who will fall in the income portfolio, um, but Rob Noss gets a really low uh, wage as a state representative, and I don't know what his partner does, so um, I don't think they're in need of a new stick-built home, but I just think that uh, as we look at the numbers, it was also mentioned that uh, there seems to be an extremely high success rate uh, for maybe one community uh, leading ahead of other communities, so I hope that we will talk about how we can keep that community succeeding and then grow success for the other parties. So thank you all very much for your unanimous support of this project. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The agreement is approved. R3, FAC 1 project plan to proceed with the construction phase of the Multnomah County Justice Center electrical d uh, bus duct system replacement project. So moved. Second. Commissioner Meyer moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of R3. Good morning. Welcome. Um, we are running a bit behind schedule, so as, <coughs> as, as succinctly as the information can be delivered, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson and Commissioners. I'm Dan Zalko, the Division Director for Facilities and Property Management within the Department of County Assets. It's nice to see you all today. Uh, we are here with a project that has been in some phase of feasibility planning and design for over four years. The reason for that is it is a very complicated and challenging project and a lot of time and effort was needed to ensure that we felt good about the project scope schedule and budget, which we do at this point. Um, it was an, it's been a really good collaboration, not just within facilities and the sheriff's office, but with our partners at the city of Portland, who owned approximately 40% of this building, both at the Portland Police Bureau and the Office of Management and Finance, and a lot of work from a number of planning, uh, design, engineering, and estimating firms as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, the Multnomah County Sheriff, to start us off with the presentation. Good morning, Board of County Commissioners. I'm Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell, Multnomah County Sheriff, and I'm happy to be here with our facilities partners to share this project. Uh, MCSO has been working closely with our county partners over the last several years to evaluate the condition of the electrical bus duct system and identify solutions for maintenance, replacement, and or any other recommendations. So we are here today to share an overview of the process, recommendations, and final proposal for addressing the bus duct system. Next slide, please. We'll cover some of the background related to the Justice Center, the bus duct system and challenges, as well as the project's history and scope as detailed on this slide. Next slide, please. The Justice Center was built in the 1980s and it's located in downtown Portland within close proximity to our federal and city partners. The Multnomah County Courthouse is also just a block away. This unique building is split into sections housing multiple services, including Multnomah County's only booking and release center, a maximum security jail setting, and the resources necessary to support these operations, including the Department of Community Justice, Corrections Health, Corrections Records, pretrial services, and four courtrooms. The other section of the building houses the Portland Police Bureau Central Precinct, encompassing multiple floors of operations. This shared commercial condominium is managed by an agreement between the city and the county. Next slide, please. The Justice Center was built utilizing a bus duct system to move electricity throughout this large facility. In essence, the bus duct functions as a spine running vertically from the lower trans transformers connecting all the way up to the top floor. With the age of this system being over 40 years, we have become increasingly worried about having system failures, and there have been challenges in performing routine maintenance. <clears throat> Next slide, please. As the Justice Center houses Multnomah County's only booking and release site and maximum security correction setting, a failure in this electrical system 
would initiate emergency operations to manage adults in custody. This would also require relocating approximately 400 incarcerated individuals, in addition to the staff working within the secure setting of MCDC, including deputies, medical professionals, and civilian staff, as well as the relocation of arraignment and court operations, DCJ and MCSO pretrial services, corrections records, and all operations located at the Portland Police Bureau Central Precinct. Next slide, please. Due to the complexities of the bus duct system, if a full or significant failure were to occur, the ability to fix or replace the affected components would include significant delays and cost. The Sheriff's Office and Portland Police Bureau would not be able to reoccupy the building for a minimum of three and a half years, creating long-term disruption in several areas of the public safety system. Due to these factors and no suitable location to shift all operations out of the Justice Center, a conduit and wire system was chosen as it is easier to access, maintain, and repair, and the work will be performed while the building is occupied. I would like to thank our county partners for all of their work and coordination in bringing this project together. I will now hand the presentation over to J.D. Deshaw. Thank you, my, thank you very morning. much, Sheriff. Um, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm J.D. Deshaw. I'm the Project Manager from Facilities and Property Management. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is a photo of what the existing bus duct system looks like on a typical court uh, holding floor. So we have one bus duct that feeds the county floors, the one beside it feeds the city floors at the top, and then the one on the far left is actually the emergency bus duct system so that we have a, a loop. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what happens when it fails. This is a photo from the Inverness jail when the bus duct failed. We were fortunate that it failed at Inverness. They were able to repair it over a weekend just a couple of, about a month ago. Uh, but the issue we've always been worried about at the Justice Center is if there's a failure, it could cascade over, take out not only the main power, but the emergency power, because they are side by side. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a little bit about the uh, project history. Uh, in 2000, fiscal year 2018, the project was identified as something that we should uh, study to figure out what is the best way to replace it. Uh, the board in fiscal year 21 uh, gave us uh, $900,000 to do uh, feasibility and planning work. And in fiscal year 23, uh, the board approved another $1.2 million for us to work, get the full design in play. Uh, the city has committed $12.5 million for their portion of the project. And then this fiscal year, the board approved an additional $1.51 million. So we've been incrementally uh, getting our funding in place for this project. Next slide, please. I'll kind of walk my way up of the building uh, going through some of the key elements. So in the lower level of the, of the building on the corner of 3rd and Madison is where the PGE vault is located. <clears throat> so currently there are three transformers and PGE has uh, been meeting with us for a couple of years and they've said, well, based on the age of the transformers, uh, they need to be replaced. So they're part of the project and we're going to replace they're gonna add another one. So we're gonna have four transformers. And that's actually a good thing because it gives us that additional redundant power. So if one transformer goes, we still have full capacity to run everything in the building. So this is a, a good thing that we're, we're gonna be adding to the project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this was one of the complications that we identified very early on, is we have a mechanical shaft and the plan was, well, we would run the conduit and wire system replacing the bus duct up through this mechanical shaft. As we looked at it with the design team, with a, a local electrical firm that does work for the county, we all realized that there was gonna be a lot of moving of equipment around, moving of uh, electrical and mechanical systems. And because the building is 40 years old, there was gonna be always the risk that we would move something, it would break, and we wouldn't be able to get it operational. So we identified that maybe looking for another path uh, in the building would be worthwhile. Uh, next slide, please. And the other thing that we identified is going, going from a bus duct system to conduit and wire would be the appropriate solution. 
Bus ducts are standard in high rises, but most high rises close for a weekend or they can be shut down for a period of time. We have a 24 seven facility. We don't have that, that opportunity. Our electrical team identified that the conduit and wire, if we had an issue on one floor, they could isolate it, they could work on it, the rest of the building would be operational. We would not be impacting operations throughout the facility and that they could do work on it uh, while uh, other operations were continuing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where we got very creative. Um, so we identified that the we, we had an issue of trying to run through the mechanical shaft. When we had that estimated, the duration for construction was nine and a half years. So we immediately realized that that is too long, it would impact sheriff's operations, a long risk. So in talking to our city partners, we identified a elevator shaft uh, that was available. The, the city has four elevators. They really were only using three on a regular basis. So we had one that we thought we could use. They thought it was a good idea and they agreed to it. The other advantage it had, this elevator shaft actually backs to our electrical room. So by using this elevator shaft, we're able to uh, go in, tie into the main electrical rooms and uh, not have a lot of disruption to the building. We also, with um, our team, identified that because it's a, an existing elevator shaft, using the elevator hoist equipment to, for construction might be a very cost-effective way to do the construction. Um, we've uh, got a lot of creative people and we've tried a lot of creative ways to, to make this a better project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of just walking you through what the process would be for, for the work. Uh, so contractor will come on board. The first thing they would do is they would create that new electrical shaft. It already has one wall that divides elevator one from the other two. So they only have to install one wall. Uh, once they have that in place, they can install uh, platforms at each level of the building. Uh, they'll be ordering the electrical equipment simultaneously. That's a 40 to 60 week lead time. So JD, I'm just gonna remind you, we've got, we've got one more agenda items after this and we're really running short of time if you could speed it up. Absolutely. It. Thank you. Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about uh, just the uh, duration. So we're in the summer of 2023, we have, uh, we're done with design, cost estimating, we're moving along. We'll be bidding the project this fall. Uh, we'll execute the contract in December and our um, target completion is July 2027. On to the money. Next slide, please. So uh, we do have a high, medium, and a low of, uh, for construction of 14 million to 18 million, meaning a total uh, project cost of 20.5 to 25.5 million. And we've included our soft costs and contingency items in there. We also at the bottom have the split between the county, city, and our third party owner. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just sort of something we built for the city and for the CFO to understand what our cost would be per year so that we could uh, make sure that we're tracking it. Uh, our contractor will be working with us to identify what that really is, but we wanted to make sure that the CFO had a preliminary idea of what our funding needs would be as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, where we are today is we are at the board requesting a resolution seeking approval to uh, go with the FAC1 project to proceed with the construction phase. And uh, next slide, please. And I think that's just questions. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this. Um, uh, we'll go to the board for any questions. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you. I appreciated the pre-briefing I got a couple of weeks ago. I have no more questions. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Broom Edwards. Just a quick question. I do I did appreciate the briefing as well and the innovative thinking um, to use the elevator shaft. Um, I'm, this is a more process question. Um, the resolution has us approving the project plan and giving authorization, authorization to proceed. Does that mean that we're approving the proposed um, budget? Uh, it's it's not it's not clear because um, just happened approve whether there's another another gate that we're approving an overall um so, 
budget. So county money for the for FY24 was approved for this project in the budget that we passed on. So June. we're done for for that piece of it. Yeah, and then as the county needs to in subsequent years continue to invest for the full completion of this project that will that will come up every budget. Okay, um, this is maybe not for you, but for the f uh, facilities team that I'd like to understand how. <laughs> Um, not here at this meeting, but understand how um, if we approve an increment, say there's an overrun, but we've already approved the project, how those come back um, to us because generally you're approving like a, a, an overall project cost. Um, my experience in a public, in, with public institutions, you approve the pro overall project cost and the project plan. Um, but it seems like we're just doing a year by year increment. So I'd like to understand just how that works in the county. So it's, a, it's a longer term process. Yeah, and this is the opportunity to see what the, the total cost is, I think, to the best of the knowledge of what they have right now. And when that is more refined, they'll come back to the board for that total, um, total project cost. Again, I'd just like to better understand, because normally you build in contingencies, it's the longer term plan, and then you have, might have a multi-year budget authorizations so I'm just mainly want to know and again this isn't specific to your project but just how we um, it, it's not once we've approved the project then we have no control over the cost so I'm just we'll, we'll have make sure facilities um, briefs you on how this how it works for this project but also in more more generally as we do these these more major projects for the county for sure right Thank you. Um, did we have any public testimony on this item? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Charles Johnson. Can I say it yet? No, not good afternoon yet. Still good morning. I'm Charles Bridge Crane Simka Johnson. I want to thank you uh, for keeping us all safe. Uh, this little piece of paper here I didn't share. In your previous materials that were shared, uh, you'll find on the centerfold of that previous material that was shared is information about Native American home ownership. Uh, sorry, that wasn't made clear in my earlier remarks. But, uh, signature autograph here. I'll be able to add this to the things I talk about with uh, Judge Brown when I'm in JC2 next week. And of course, this also affects the safety of uh, every inmate, including Barry Joe Stahl, who's currently bouncing back and forth between county detention and uh, the Oregon DOC system until this fall. So uh, thanks to the team who came up with what looks like a great cost-saving uh, procedure. And uh, twice in a row, I get to look forward to you all unanimously voting for a good project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Bernadette Bram Edwards? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The resolution is adopted. R4, declaring July 16th through July 22nd, 2023, as pretrial probation parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon. May I have a motion? So moved. <laughs> Second. Commissioner Jamal moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R4. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Vega Peterson and uh, members of the board. I think we have some slides to Tasia. My name is Erica Pruitt, and I am the director of the Department of Community Justice, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm here today with Denise Pena to honor the work of all DCJ employees during the celebration of National Pretrial Probation and Parole Supervision Week. Each year, the American Probation and Parole Association, APPA, celebrates professionals who play a vital role in public safety by supervising individuals in the community and helping keep families intact. I'm honored to be a past president of APPA, which helped me to see that Multnomah County truly is on the cutting edge of community justice practices. Next slide, please. DCJ is an integral part of our community safety system. Our employees embody the county's values and monitors individuals with compassion. It takes every single person in our department to support our vision of community safety through positive change. I want to underscore this year's theme, stronger together. As we face unparalleled times here in Multnomah County, DCJ is focused on strengthening our partnerships and collaborations with community-based organizations, county departments, and public safety agencies to address violence and harm while helping people engage in positive change. We serve the highest risk populations based 
base our decisions on outcomes and evidence-based practices and invest in programming that improves community safety while helping individuals change their behavior. Next slide, please. Now we will share some highlights of the work we're doing. And I'm gonna talk about our juvenile services division. Juvenile services is currently updating our detention facility to be more developmentally appropriate and trauma informed. We just held a dedication ceremony for a new outdoor recreation space that includes a covered yard that allows for year round outdoor activities. Thank you for your continued support of this project. Our new juvenile director, Dr. Kyla Armstrong Romero, has been focused on community engagement and investing in pro-social upstream interventions through the Community Healing Initiative. She has also been integral in coordinating violence reduction efforts. We've also recently hired a restorative justice coordinator in detention. The person works closely with the restorative justice coordinator embedded in our juvenile probation team. Now I will turn it over to Denise Pina, our deputy director. Good morning. Good morning and soon to be afternoon, Chair Vega Peterson and members of the board. My name is Denise Pena, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Deputy Director for DCJ. I will talk a little bit of a, about our Adult Services Division. Like Juvenile, the adult side is focused on increased community presence as we adjust our operations to our new post-pandemic world. We continue to expand our culturally responsive services and supports. The HEAT program, which stands for Habilitation, Empowerment, Accountability, and Therapy, was originally piloted with black and African-American young men. Now we also have HEAT programming for black and African-American women, youth in our juvenile detention, and we're exploring to expand to our Latinx population as well. We transitioned the Diane Wade House to the Diane Wade program, which you may know is an Afrocentric women's transitional housing with culturally specific programming. After a pause in services while we adjusted the program, we are excited to say that we'll be accepting new clients starting next month in a partnership with the Urban League of Portland. We've also seen great success with the Stabilization and Readiness Program, or SARP. This program operates in the Mead Building downtown and serves the highest risk, high needs, individual on supervision who are experiencing severe and persistent mental illness. This team also won the Innovation Award this year and we are proud of them for finding solutions to a complex issue. You may be aware that the pretrial system in Multnomah County has undergone significant changes in collaboration with the state court system, DCJ employees, I'm sorry, with the state court system, DCJ employees in pretrial recog and our own business application team were integral in designing and implementing new technology and risk assessments. And I finally want to uplift our employees going to work every day in the Mead Building. This office is right in the epicenter of downtown, much like our DCHS, health department, and library partners. We have made concentrated efforts to improve the inside of the Mead, incorporating trauma-informed design principles and restructuring our presence there. And I will briefly talk about our director's office. The director's office for DCJ has over 60 employees who show up virtually and in person to support the operations of the department. These are dedicated individuals who believe in our mission and values and who work tirelessly to support their colleagues and the work being done in both our adult and our juvenile services division. And last but not least, we have our victim and survivor services team, which works with individuals in the community that have been harmed. This unit is the only post-conviction system-based advocacy team that can help individuals navigate regaining a sense of safety and security and they are an integral part of the work that we do every day. And that was just a brief overview of the few things that are happening right now with DCJ. The photo you see on the screen includes some additional highlights of employees, volunteers, and community partners, and I will just highlight them very quickly. From top left, we have Rudy Serna with the Medicine Bears Director and Jose Ruiz Valentin, one of our Juvenile Custody Service Specialists. We have Esteban Mendez, who is one of our juvenile court counselors and placement coordinator, and Esteban is also part of our peer support network, which provides confidential support to employees. We have juvenile court counselor Candace Johnson, who just retired with Justice Sanchez, a former client of ours. And we also highlight parole and probation officers at a community events, and also participating in a joint operation with the US Marshals and the Portland Police Bureau. And lastly, but not least, we have Mario Palma with Latino, Latino Network Chai Adult Program Mentor and Scott Bradley, a Hope Center pastor 
and Josh Gonzalez, who is a Latino care manager from Latino Network, and I will pass it back to Erica. And with your permission, Chair Vega Peterson, I would like to read the proclamation. Please go ahead. Before the Board of County Commissioners from Multnomah County, Oregon, declaring July 16th through July 22nd, 2023 as pretrial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of County Commissioner finds employees of the Department of Community Justice, DCJ, possess a wide variety of skills and experience that helps us attain the vision of community safety through positive change. Annually, DCJ supervises over 7,500 adult probationers and parolees, processes over 13,000 cases in our recognizance unit, receives over 2,200 youth referrals, serves approximately 1,010 youth and their families, which includes diversion, informal and formal supervision and detention, provides victim advocacy services to over 1,800 victims and survivors and completes over 1,000 mediations between parents involved in custody disputes. DCJ staff treats justice-involved individuals, youth, and their families with dignity while recognizing the right of the public to be safeguarded from criminal activity. DCJ inclusively leads with race by recognizing and addressing the hist history of systemic inequities to become an equitable, inclusive, and racially just organization. DCJ works in partnership with community agencies and law enforcement towards a shared vision of a safer community and participates in critical reform efforts addressing disparities in our system. DCJ staff use best practices when holding justice-involved individuals accountable as they deliver supervision, sanction, and treatment resources to improve community safety and address the factors that drive crime. DCJ is dedicated to providing services and protection for crime victims and survivors. DCJ staff recognizes that their public safety impact is long-term helping individuals to change their behavior, restore their families, and build stronger and safer communities. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioner proclaims July 16th through July 22nd, 2023, is declared pretrial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon, in honor, recognition, and respect for the dedication and contributions of county's community justice staff. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, we'll go to the board for any comments and we'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you so much um, for for this presentation and um, I, I'm sorry, it's kind of toward the end of the day because it, it merits so much um, gratitude and, uh, and, and, appreci and appreciation. Um, you both um, have done such a great job of describing the the services of DCJ and the people, the amazing people who um, lead many of the the really um, beautiful programs that you described. And I personally am deeply appreciative of the work that you and your team do to advance justice and healing so importantly in our community, particularly among those who are um, historically uh, marginalized, disenfranchised, and vulnerable, and including victims of crimes. Uh, the restorative work that you do, the SARP program, like there is, there is so much um, depth and breadth to the work that you do, and uh, you know, you deserve way more than a week. Um, uh, of, uh, of celebration and elevation, um, but I'm glad to support you in this week and celebrate with you and all of the members of your, of your team. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Marin. Thank you, Commissioner Dara Paul. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, um, Erica and Denise. I totally agree with Commissioner Myron. You deserve, all of you deserve more than a week. Um, but delighted to be able to support this week. I think in years past, we've had folks in the audience um, to be in. You know, it's always great to be able to appreciate people kind of personally. 
the work you do is so important and so difficult, and I know you and your teams have persevered through a really complicated time, and continues to be a complicated time, a lot of calls for change and reform, a lot of pressure on the public safety system. Um, so I too just completely appreciate not just the work, but the approach that you take, um, the effort to be, to have restorative practices and to focus on trauma and healing as well um, as on the accountability part of the work, which is often the part of the work that's focused on um, to the detriment of some of those other things. I had the chance to visit the SARC program a few weeks ago. It is amazing. Um, it's truly amazing. You know, one of the asks that I had as I left, and I'll make it to you as well, was I always want to think, okay, what's the next step? And I heard a lot about the fact that what, what the SARP program does is wonderful in terms of bringing people in, building relationships, and then housing continues to be an issue. And so my question was, what would the ideal housing look like for the people that you serve? You know, what does that, what does that look like? And I, I asked it because I imagine that it's not necessarily <laughs> the kind of housing that we are developing right now. So I would, I would love to have additional conversations about that. Um, you know, I, this is about celebration, but I do have, I do, I do wonder what do you see as, you, there, there are funding challenges at the state. Um, you know, what, do you, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing right now and what are the opportunities? Thank you for that question. You know, one of the things that um, what we're seeing is as we see our budgets reduce, um, especially at the state level, we see that we are serving the highest risk. And the highest risk, as you know, just you know, as we all travel through our communities, um, have some really complex needs. And so really, you know, I was checking in with um, Chair Vega Peterson yesterday and just talking about really continuing to refine what is what is happening with our treatment services, how what is the effectiveness of those services in serving our clients and meeting their needs? The question that you ask about what's the exact type of housing that we would need for those individuals that are coming and receiving services to the SARP. Those are questions that we will continue to explore, especially using our research and planning team to continue to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of the programs that our taxpayers are investing in. And that is one of Denise and my priorities. Denise, do you want to add? Um, no, I would just add that our research and planning team over the pandemic already began the process of how do we survey our clients and what their needs are. And so we just really want to expand on that, um, not just for the SARP issue, but just even in general, how are clients receiving our services and engaging with our staff. And I would just add, uh, Commissioner Jayapal, that you know, in um, our testimony, we talked about long term. Our community safety impact is long term, and the reason why it's long term is that we invest a lot in our staff, our juvenile court counselors, our juvenile custody service specialists, our POs, to understand best practices so that they can help people to change their behavior. But we know that they're only on supervision for so much time. So that's why we're so committed to investing in community based services because we know that's where the long-term supports are. And so I'm interested over the next year in talking to our community providers about what does that long-term support um, look like because those are, those are the services that our clients need to know how to navigate and need to know how to access so that they can continue to desist from crime. Thank you for that. that you know, I look forward to having that conversation. I think that's a great conversation. And um, thank you again for being here for all the work. Thank you, Commissioner Brim Edwards. Good afternoon. I guess. Good <laughs> um, I always love when my first interaction is like um, voting to celebrate something and to recognize um, work of a group. And I'll just say I'm looking forward to learning more about the work you do. Um, just the highlight and presentation this morning. Um, I, I'm really appreciative what the services that you provide, and like I say, looking forward to learning more about it. Thank you. You're halfway through the week, so hopefully you have more to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just really um, thank you, Denise and Erica, for bringing this forward. It really is important for us to have this chance in, in our board meetings and this public um, session to, to appreciate the work of the in, in entire um, 
Department of Community Justice, I, I appreciated Denisha lifting up the work of the folks in the director's office, right, and how they how they are really integral to the work that we're that happens all across um, parole and probation and supervision. Um, you know, DCJ has the really complex task of, of making sure that the people that we are working with are, are um, going towards paths of, of restoration and, um, and being on a stronger path than they were about um, reflecting and growing, growing our um, overall community safety, including those of the, of the victims. And I know, Denise, you have worked um, so much over the years with the, with the Victim Service Unit, and I really appreciate that work and, that, and the work that that team continues to do. Um, I also wanted to just acknowledge um, the work that's happening and, and kind of the environment that is happening in our broader community um, and its impacts to our juvenile services division. I know that um, when we talk, when we hear stories about gun violence, when we hear stories about um, people um, dying and being killed because of gun violence, these are often people that we are working closely with. Are, these are often youth who have um, relationships with DCJ, and I know that it has an impact. Um, for our employees as well. So yes, this is a you know this is a chance to lift up the work, but also I want to acknowledge that because I know that has a huge impact on our employees. Um, the work isn't easy, and we have incredible staff that are doing this work, and um, just really appreciate the work all of you are doing, um, and Kyla and Jay um, included in terms of the leadership team um, for our county, um, and just really appreciate um, the work that everybody is is doing in DCJ for this. So I want to thank you. Um, for this chance to be able to acknowledge this and celebrate the work. Um, and really, um, Erica, I have appreciated your partnership as we're talking about the issues of, of how can we engage you know, broadly with the providers and the work that's happening with our community partners, how we can really bring um, restorative justice principles into that. I've really appreciated that too, so I look forward to the work to come on this. Thank you. Thank you. Great. May we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye, the proclamation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both so much. Um, we're done with our um, main agenda items, so now we have time for board comment. Um, Commissioner Dunn, we have a meeting that you need to get to, so if you need to be excused for that, please go ahead and do that. Um, I did want to share a few updates with the board um, on um, things that have been happening this week. So. Um, a couple of the things um, that I wanted to talk about. One is um, we had our um, regular check-in. I think it happens um, every every month or um, with the with the mayor and the governor. Um, and so these are like conversations that we've been having even since before I was sworn in that have been incredibly helpful as we talk about the relationship of the county working with the state and the city and Commissioner Brimmethers. So I'm talking that mainly for your benefit to to know um, that those are happening. But we had. Some good conversations today around um, the work that we're doing together um, around um, homelessness, around public safety, and around behavioral health. And one of the things that I, I shared with them and I want to share with this board is that um, my office is going to be taking a, a, a more active leadership role, and I personally am going to be taking a more active um, role in um, the projects that we have going on um, with the health department, including with Beacon. Um, I think that we have had a lot of conversations around um, you know, over the years around this project, and we've had, I think, um, some really good work done by our health department in this project, but I think also with the transitions that we've had in leadership positions because of staff, because of different roles within behavioral health, um, and, um, you know, we want to move forward with this. So I've had, we want to move forward with this in a more directive, action-oriented way, and that's a real priority for me. So I've had conversations with several of the people who have been engaged in this work on the Beacon Executive Committee, and so um, we'll be continuing that effort, um, and we'll be having a series of meetings over the next several weeks um, as we've put out the RFPQ to get providers qualified to be engaged with the county's work on these efforts, but we know that this is a much larger um, body of work that's going to take um, really good partnership and really concerted partnership with, with other folks. So um, we, we shared that update. We also had some really good conversations about um, the work that we're going to be doing going forward with in terms of um, the support that's, that's needed from the, the city and county and, and some of the bigger issues. So I just um, wanted to make sure that I was sharing that with all of you. And then, um, you know, we will be continuing to have um, uh, conversations around the, the time, place, and manner um, conversation. So, um, Commissioner Brim Edwards, thank you for your leadership on that. I think that um, 
um, the COO has been um, kicking off a process. So we, my office and the COO's team has been um, looking at an analysis of the impacts to the county as well as our response, and um, and we're engaging deeply with our departments on that. So as we are getting updates from the city and we're having br briefings with the um, city, we'll also be talking about you know the work that's going on internally at the county for that. Um, so um, just wanted to share those things, and we'll continue to have the conversation about this. Um, I'll probably on our one-on-ones have um, another conversation around the AOC dues um, conversation, which might be a new one for you. You have had lots of conversations about this, but just uh, bringing that up as well. Um, we'll have a we have a meeting in the fall with all of the with the Tri County, Washington, um, Clackamas, and Multnomah County, and that's one thing that um, you know people wanted to focus on as we get ready to have this conversation more broadly with AOC. Um, with that, I will turn it over for any comments. I'm Commissioner Brad Edwards. Great, thank you. I've just got a couple um, things, and a couple things just to react um, to your updates, um, not reactions, but maybe just, um, I'm curious, um, I'm glad to hear the county staff is um, assessing the impacts of the time, manner, place, camping restrictions. And I'm wondering, um, so we have the city coming in next week. Um, does did the county staff wanna um, present or do they want to just have the city present um, and we have we have the um, discussion and questions from the Commission or does the county staff um, I, I don't have a preference but I'm just I, I want to I don't want to have heard that and then not provide them the opportunity if you'd like yeah no I appreciate that I think that um, I want to make sure that we're getting the information we need from the city and then having a lot of opportunity to ask them, the board to having a lot of opportunity to ask them questions. So we can focus on that if we, um, and I'm, I'm pro um, happy to give kind of an update of, of where the work has happened so far during that time, but we, I don't know that we need to have a, make time for that so that we can make sure we can focus on what the city's doing at that point. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, thank you for the update on um, the, Behavior. I'm going to try not to use the acronyms because I know everybody else doesn't. The behavioral health um, emergency coordination network. Emergency coordination network or Beacon. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious how that is going to interface um, with the um, when we had the presentation um, on fentanyl. Um, I had asked a question about the larger the larger plan, like how many treatment beds are needed. You know, how many do we have? And um, I believe the answer was that we were going to get some sort of plan this summer. Um, is that integrated, going to be integrated into it? Or how, how is that coming back to, to the commission? Yeah, that absolutely will. So I will say internally, um, our health department had a, uh, like a one day retreat just all day yesterday talking about um, both like the, all of the work that's happening and needs to happen here at the county, but also the partners that need to be engaged in with. Um, in for the response and so that's something that we're gonna um, well you know I haven't even had a chance to hear you know all the outcomes of that but I'll be giving that later this week um, so that will be a piece of it and then you know in the conversations with our healthcare partners as they are making investments that um, and in having conversations about the investments that they'll be doing that those kinds of conversations I want to have be brought into the work that that will that I'll be engaging with that the county's engaging with around our behavioral um, Health response overall, and and how how that whole plan fits together. So that's that's how it will be um, brought in together. So and um, we'll have some more information about that. I just want to make sure you were updated on what's going on, and so that we can, um, you know, so that you can be aware, and so we can continue to have those conversations. Great. And then my um, last thing is um, just in terms of the presentation this morning. Um, I don't think I can recall that I've ever been at, like told. That you know, I should submit my questions afterwards. Um, and, you know, as a new commissioner, I feel like I didn't have a chance to participate in the, um, just because when I got, was sworn in, so I missed the whole budget cycle. Um, and I would, it would be useful for us to, again, I can ask, submit my questions, but also um, I know from talking to lots of community members that people have a lot of questions about, and I feel questioning about how the county is moving ahead and my experience in a public being in a public entity is that you build we build trust and credibility but even when we don't have it all figured out um, by having those conversations it, it, in public um, or the question that I might have as a new commissioner there's a thousand people out in the community who might have the same question 
Um, so I'm, I'm disappointed we didn't have t time for that during the meeting today and um, hope that we um, are gonna have a lot of really robust conversations over the next uh, month and a half before we have to, to vote on it. Um, and I would ask, since I wasn't able to ask them, that um, I be able to you know, submit my questions and they become part of the record of this morning's uh, meeting. And I'll also post them um, online so people can benefit. Again, I do believe when, often when a commissioner um, has a question, it's something that a lot of other community members also are wondering and that's how we build support um, for, our, for our work. And then the last item um, I would, and this is like a question that I, um, that I think people are confused about um, in the broader community, and that I'm getting a lot of questions about is the, the whole issue with the smoking supplies, whether that was a last year's budget, and it was, so my, under, my understanding was that it was to funds that weren't used to buy syringes because the decrease in uses were shifted in the FY23 budget. Um, that's my was my understanding, and yet um, spokespeople from the county are saying that it was presented as part of the FY '24 um, budget um, materials, and so it, I'm c confused what part of the budget that was, and and which year's budget? I mean, it wasn't I wasn't part of either either budget, um, but the implication was that if people should. Commissioner should have known because there was a presentation as part of the May 24, the, the May presentation on the 2024 budget, although it appeared, it, my understanding, it looks like the funds came from the 2023 budget. So the, the money that was used, um, allocated for that by the health department was underspent money from the 2023 budget because um, they have had such a decrease in the people who have been um, uh, taking advantage of the harm reduction services because of the switch between um, ejection and needles to um, smoking and you know smoking supplies. So there had been a like just underspending because of that, and um, the proposal to use those dollars were really about how can we continue to engage in this population that we need to have the outreach to have the connection to provide. I think we heard some public testimony this morning that was really talking about all the different ways that those harm reduction services make connections and, and are entrance ways for, for people um, into all of the different options around you know um, public health um, uh, concerns and, and treatment options. So, so that was the, the thinking behind reallocating those dollars. Um, that was part of the 2023. I think what was presented both at the, um, the budget presentation as well as the, the fentanyl update that we had had um, at the end of June was around um, the plan for um, using, using those dollars and using the supplies for fiscal year 24, within the fiscal year 24 period. So there's another, there's another allocation for smoking supplies in the 2024? No, it was part of the, like what the plan of what the department, what the public health department, what our what harm reduction team was planning for the work within 2024. So the work within 2024, but using 2023 dollars. dollars. Yes. Just the way it, it sounds is like that the, the board approved it as part of the 2024 budget because they the reference continues to be about the um, that May budget presentation, and it, it, it it's not clear to a lot of people. And so, I, like for example, I'm being asked, like, hey, was that was this? Again, I didn't vote on either of those budgets, but was that in just is that underspend from 2023 and in 2024? So I think what I'm hearing you say was the decision was made to redirect funds in the 2023 budget. And the 2024 budget doesn't have an increment of funds for that. And the, the I'm almost there. And then the, um, but the reason why staff is referencing the May budget presentation is that there's going to be there was going to be work that was funded by the 23 budget in the 24 budget year. 
That's sorry, exactly. that was a long sentence. No, but that, but you're right. That's okay. that's exactly right. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. All right, thank you, Commissioner Myron. So sorry, I um, I'm gonna go uh, just for my clarification now um, on that one. Uh, 2023 budget, we had harm reduction allocation for syringes and other other things because of a decrease in um, the demand for syringes, which could be interpreted as a, a good thing because fewer people are using syringes, which, which cause a great deal of harm. But the decision was made to use that money to put that towards smoking supplies. And you made that decision in early May after talking to the health department Okay, and then and then there was the briefing later in later in May and June. I think it was while I was out of town. Like the, I guess during. So. So then we had our hearings on the budget after that, but that wasn't referenced in the budget hearings for fiscal year twenty four. Uh, so Even though that decision had been made by you in early May. I'm so, trying to so during the budget presentation that the health department did, and specifically with the public health department, Jessica Guernsey mentioned a, about the, the plan to do that to the board in her comments on that in that May presentation. And then it was also mentioned in the June 28th, um, which you were out of town for. Right. I, I did. Did watch it um, a couple of times. Okay. All right. That I think I understand. Um, and uh, I, I just, I just had a couple of comments as well, and maybe some questions just related to the update that you gave. And um, you know, I think it, it relates to what I mentioned earlier about uh, figuring out how to talk about as a board um, how we have that open transparent process so that we can you know really plan prioritize and assess um, have work sessions that are public rather than kind of um, hearing about things after the fact or um, being reactive and and responsive uh, and I think you know there are a couple of cases in point where, you know, I, I mentioned the housing Multnomah now, but um, the one I think you brought up in your update that's related is uh, the joint letter from Congressman Blumenauer and Governor Kotek about, to you and the um, mayor about the behavioral health situation in the city and county. And I don't, was this, was this shared with County commissioners. It was a letter to me and the mayor, so it wasn't. Okay, but it is about the core work of the county and needs that we would be, things we would need to be doing as a county over the next 60 days or so. And so what, I guess, what goes into your decision making about things that you share with the board versus things that you do not. Because I, I consider that a really important letter. Like I was shocked to see that that had happened and that we weren't, that I wasn't aware. Um, so I'm just curious. So that was, a, that was a letter to the mayor and myself. And oftentimes when we receive public letters like this, um, people will choose to copy the county board or they will choose to copy the city commission that wasn't the case in this time okay um so you didn't raise with them whether to talk whether to talk to the board or the city at all about these things i, I just think they involve so many of us and i i i feel that it's a it is a miscommunication and it's concerning because it does ultimately reflect on the board when suddenly there's an article about the plan, a lack of a plan. It's like, then the county's going to do this thing. 
and we represent the county as the board, but it's something we have no knowledge about and it's something that you are making decisions about exclusively as the chair. And so I just want to, I, I think we need to figure out some of that communication so that we are able to collectively and collaboratively address the core issues of our county that are the most important issues facing our constituents collectively. Yeah, I've said it multiple times, like the transparency that I wanna have is very important, but by the nature of my role as chair, there are gonna be a lot of things that are just gonna come across my desk or into my office that um, that are gonna be related to, um, di either directed to me specifically or entailing the work about the administration of the county. Um, and so, you know, for the major things, especially those things that are requiring board action, um, you know, I wanna make sure that we're gonna be transparent in the process that we're gonna have here and have opportunity for folks to engage in this and, um, you know, understanding the frustration that you had with not being able to do questions. I will say like, it is a fairly common practice when we're short of time to have, and to making sure that, you know, everybody on the board has a chance, equal opportunity during these public meetings to have questions, to submit questions in writing. I mean, that, if you look at back after the, um, the past budget meetings, like that, that is a very frequent thing that happens. Um, but, but it is also, you know, wanting to have this be the kickoff to that public process. So just for that example, um, you know, and we can, we can continue to have conversations about how we can improve the process of, of what, you know, what to share and what not, but there will be, I mean, there's a difference between being a chair and a commissioner in terms of, of that. And so, um, so there will be things that, um, that, that, you know, I'll have knowledge to first or I'll have access to. I want to be as clear as possible, but I also want to make sure that, um, for the things that really impact, um, you know, county, um, uh, county, you know, administration or our executive side of things, that th those are things that are within, you know, my purview and the purview of myself and the COO and our team there. But I do think that, um, and and again, like you know, the governor and and Congressman Blumauer and their staff are very well versed in. in um, communicating to other public officials and other jurisdictions, and they chose to send the, that email to, to the mayor and I, and, and, you know, and that was how we responded in kind. Okay, um, I guess along, again, along those lines, because when I receive something like that, I, I share it with people who would be part of my team in making decisions. Um, and uh, again, I, there are some things that I propose way later, later than I would have because I didn't know about that. Um, but like the corrective action plan from the supportive housing services measure, um, that's another one. You know, just as examples, the the you know initially with the um, housing plan that the governor rejected. You know, these things that get rejected and we don't even know as board members, and it comes out in the papers like I didn't even. That uh, I, I didn't know, and I didn't have a role in you know making those decisions. So how to how to balance that? So I look forward to ongoing conversation about that process and how to do it effectively. And then I did want to make a proposal around behavioral health because I did learn of the governor and uh, congressman's letter about that, and uh, and had infer and in fact led work around that that is almost complete that could respond to their requests. And I've been working with uh, Congressman Blumenauer for uh, quite a long time around behavioral health. Um, and so I would suggest, I'm gonna put out the action steps and we'll follow, out, uh, follow up, but first, we finalized that plan underway to create a functional behavioral health system, and we do not have that. It's a plan called Analyze, Align, and Act, a Blueprint for Better Behavioral Health, and I co-led that process with Ebony Clark, and it involved pretty much the key leaders around the beacon table, um, Judge Nan Waller, uh, so many others, people with lived experience. So we have a matrix of prioritization and priorities 
for a functioning system that has already been evaluated, vetted, laid out as a result of a deep systems analysis for mental health care in our county. And so we can just finish that. We don't need a seven-year procurement process for a beacon network. That could maybe be a portion of it, but we're making things way more complicated, expensive, and time-consuming than they need to be. There is a process for a plan that could be completed for minimal investment within a year. Then we should invest intelligently in key components of the system we know we need. So I'll propose two right now. We will have further conversation, but that is the Crown Plaza for recovery-oriented supportive housing and bridge housing for people coming out of the treatment we all know we need, but right now people are discharged to homelessness. The other one is stop having meetings about Beacon, focus on a single element of a system that we know we need. I would suggest a CATSI-like center for treatment of co-occurring disorders, but we can decide. Put out an RFP and get that thing done and just work on that instead of a seven-year procurement for XYZ that, frankly, I still don't understand. Um, and then we should share this with the public effectively and just as, as it's going on so they're aware every step of the way. And then we need to declare a public health emergency for uh, the fentanyl crisis. And I've begun reaching out to people, experts, and others who should be at the table externally. And I know we've, we've started talking about this, which is great. Um, and, uh, and then to be able to do this before fall, before, um, we don't need to wait. And I don't know what the waiting is about in the meetings and the more meetings. When there's an emergency, we should act. And this has been an emergency for far, far too long. I think those are my comments. Thank, Thank you. you. No, I appreciate that. And I'm all about action. I mean, the fact of the matter is there was about $2 million that were spent on Beacon for the first two years of work, and there was not a single bed or access or, you know, slot of service that was increased during that process. So I'm very much committed to um, having action and having having the county be the, the convener and the leader in this work. So I appreciate that, and I will look forward to your partnership on this. I know you have a lot of expertise and things to, to give to this, and I, and I really appreciate that. So we are way over time. I appreciate everyone's um, patience and stick to in this with this. Um, with that, we are adjourned. We will see you next week.